In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Glory to thee, O God, glory to thee, heavenly King, O Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present, and fill us all things, I treasure every good and bestower of life. Come and dwell in us, and cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O good one. Some people made some comments and said that they were surprised that I was doing another talk so close to the other one. And it's true, I don't usually do that because we just finished the talk, which took a long time to edit it and fix it all up and all that. And that happened three weeks ago. And then we had three weeks to prepare for this talk, which usually I take longer. So it was very stressful to do that. So you might ask, why would I do that? Well, Father Seraphim Rose gave a very good answer. He said, it's later than you think. That's what he used to say all the time. It's later than you think. In other words, start doing some about your salvation. Start thinking about your salvation. Start struggling because it's later than you think. And also the sign of the times that he was referring to. I wonder what he would say today if he was living in what we're living through now which doesn't compare to what he lived through in the, you know, when he died in the, uh, around 80, I think, 1980, 70, something like that. There is an urgency, and that's why I did it, because we don't know when the next lockdown's going to be. We don't know what's... There is a move, and it's not a conspiracy theory, it's obvious if you have a brain, that they're, they're trying to... People are trying to control the world. And, and unfortunately, as we will see as we go on, many hierarchs in the Orthodox Church are obeying these people. But not only are they obeying them, they're also telling their flocks to obey, to accept the vaccines, to accept that the churches are being closed, and um, everything else that they did during that. Someone's making noise, I can't concentrate. Thank you, that's all. So um, that's why I had to do it quickly. They're already bragging how they controlled the world and how they were successful in locking people up and things like that. And that, and they're speaking about another lockdown. To, to their, and they want to. They've, they've got this mania, this obsession with two things: climate, climate change, whatever they call it now, and the other one is population. It's they, they believe it's the world is overpopulated. I'm going to give you two examples of what. Some very important people said, some well-known people said, not Gates, not them, these are royal people. That will show you how obsessed they are with those two topics, apart from that they're obsessed with Russia, but that's another one. Number one, Prince Philip, before he died, 
he said, I don't know the exact words, but words to the effect of that if he's reincarnated, he would like to come back to earth as a deadly disease so that he can wipe out most of the population because of, the, because of overpopulation. He said that. No one said anything about it, but he did. And there's evidence that he said it, that if he could, he would come back as a really, really horrible, deadly disease so that he can get the planet at a better population. Now, the other royal person was his son. And his son, well, he's got three sons, didn't he? So we better, better, better stick to the new king of England. He said in a video some, I don't know how many years ago, he said that we have to get this uh, carbon emissions under control. We have to, he was all, you know, talking in his posh accent and he was saying that we have to do something about it. And what he proposes is that there will be a military police, but not for per country. A military police similar to the World Health, Health Organization that would dictate into the whole world what they're going to do about this pandemic. He wants some type of military police that will be in charge of the whole world. They will go into any country they want and they will arrest people or do whatever they want to control these gases and carbon and things like that and he said he even said sorry so he was polite he said sorry but the government will not have any say governments will not have any say in any country these will be a one world military police type of thing that we're going to help to control all this pollution and things like that so his father wants to come back as a deadly virus. So the whole thing is, as I said, environment, population control. They're obsessed with it in the West. And if you read the prophecies about the Antichrist when he comes, I'm not saying he's come now, he will gain control through certain organisations. He will take control of the money, as you saw what they did to Rush with the money and they stopped the bank because they're in control of the SWIFT system, it's how you transfer money. But they're making up another system now. And the other one they want to do is through the health, through health, like the World Health Organization. The Antichrist will take control of that, which they did, but these weren't the Antichrist. These were forerunners of the Antichrist with small a, not the Antichrist. They will prepare, so they're preparing now. These vaccine passports, these chips in people and all that's all preparing exactly what it said in the in Revelation, exactly what the Holy Father's Orthodox Church prophesied about all this. So as Father Seraphim said, Father Seraphim Rose, it's later than what we think. That's a little introduction. So I have, before we uh, go into the main part of the talk, I have 10 little appetizers, spiritual appetizers, I said last time. And I did I did read this, the whole story last time, but I wanted just to read, to remind, remind us, because I thought this was very, very good. It was in the St. Kirill of Kazan, where he wasn't of Kazan then in Russia, when they banned the services of the holy water on the 6th of January because they wanted the water to be boiled and then to do the service. He said no. Later on, he became a new martyr under the communists. This happened in 1909, but later on, he became a new martyr under the communists. Now, a reporter wrote something and said, more faith was shown in the firewood necessary to boil the water and kill the germs than in God. And, I, and as I read last time, I'm gonna reread it again. More faith was shown in the vaccine and COVID hygiene rules than in God. Now you might say, well, yes, that's true. The secular people, the governments, yes, the health authorities, they did. No, no, no. We expect that from them. They're, they're, they're unbelievers, they're forerunners, whatever they are. Where I'm talking about here, and I'll read it again. Many 
Orthodox clergy had more faith in the vaccine and COVID hygiene rules than in God. You say, but that's, that's, that's not fair to say that. How do, you, how do you know that? Well, they shut the churches. And they kept on saying, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. They kept on going about it. And if you didn't, then you're a, per, a bad person. Number two, appetizer. We see we have spiritual appetizers. As I said last time, we want to have these little things that we hear and read so that we can be, be prepared when we get into the more media part of the talk, which will be more detail. That's the same when you do spiritual reading. Read easy things first, then you read the ones that are a little bit heavier and need more concentration. St. John Chrysostom said, we must not mind insulting men if by respecting them we offend God. This is a disease that, are, that exists today and has always existed. There are people that are so weak, they don't want to offend. I often say this to some parents, some women, for example, that are so weak, weak, they're weak, they can't say anything to anyone. I said, I say to them, if a relative was molesting your child, I believe you wouldn't say anything. And some of them even say probably because they're too weak to say anything. So in the church, there are so many issues and we say, oh, I'm not going to say anything because it might offend my priest. Like some people saying, um, I'm, oh no, before I go to the church, there was a, a, a person who was working for someone and he was being bullied and they used to make him work through lunch, etc., etc. And they abused him badly. And I said to him, you should actually um, go for compensation because you were bullied. And they used to make him work seven, eight hours straight and then give him lunch. And I said, um, I think you should go for it. And you know what he said to me? He said, oh, I don't think I can do that because he was nice to me sometimes. He let me go home early. And I said, so you're going to throw away compensation because he let you go home early. That's an example for that. But we have that example in the church too. I'm going to baptize my child. I go, really? Does your priest uh, uh, dip the child deep, completely in the water three times? Because I don't know. You better, watch the, you better watch for that. So they come back and say, no, he doesn't. He just puts it in the font and pours some water on top. Greeks do that. They like, they have, like they're bathing the child. Russians are much better. They get the babies, uh, well, the babies are smaller because they like to baptise about eight days old. I, I, like, I prefer 40 days, but eight days to 40 days. Babies are small. They get them, dip in the water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit three times before the child is in, has a chance to even get a gulp. They don't drown. Maybe sometimes it might go, eh, eh, that's it. What's that? Another church, they sprinkle. Like, like Catholics. And then the Greeks, a lot of them, they baptise the children at two, three years old. And if they've got weight problems, it's going to be very hard to get them into the font. And they pour water on them. So I said, I wouldn't do that. You tell the priest, if you don't immerse my child three times in the world, I'm not going to get her baptised here. Probably say, no, don't do that. You're going to miss out on the money. So... They say, I can't do that. He's a nice priest. That's just one example. There's so many more. We must not mind insulting men if by respecting them we offend God. People prefer to offend God than to offend a person. And that's wrong. You think about that. That's St. John Chrysostom. We have to learn when you need to, to speak up they don't have to go crazy and start screaming. They say, you just say, no, that's not right. Like people, um, when my father died, I've said this example in previous talks, some Greek woman came and she put a cup of water. I go, what's that? She goes, this is before I became a priest. She goes, that's for the soul to drink. And I said, no, 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 no. We don't believe in that and tipped it out. But someone else would say, oh, I don't want to offend her. So we don't want to offend the magician or whatever she was. But we're willing to offend God and affect the soul of the newly departed person. Because when we do these things, we affect their souls too. 
Superstition, the body's there and we're doing superstitions. At that time, the soul needs this, the grace of God. The soul cannot receive the grace of God if surrounded. The people are graceless. Number three, Revelation. That's the last book in the New Testament. But people who are cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, in other words, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, those who worship idols, uh, and all liars will find themselves in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Brimstone means sulfur. This is the second death. I'm not going to explain all of that, but there was one part in there which is going to be very important for this talk, and people miss it. Did anyone hear a word that I was surprised with that St. John, who wrote this, inspired by God, he said something which people never even would have thought of would be something which would cause us to lose our souls. And that word was, which I've underlined, cowardly. We expect unbelieving. We expect abominable. Those who do atrocious things, murderers, sexually immoral, those who do magic, uh, those who worship idols, liars, well, even the liars are a good one too, will find themselves in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, in other words, in hell. But it's very surprising that St. John includes in that list cowardly as being something which would be an obstruction for us to, uh, to be saved. Those who are cowards. Cowards in what? When we have doctors who were very, very, very well-known doctors before COVID, um, Dr. John, is it John? Dr. McAuliffe, what's his first name again? Peter. Peter, Peter. Dr. Peter McAuliffe and many others who were top. For example, Dr. McAuliffe has published the most peer reviews, I think, in the world. He's so good. But once he started speaking against the vaccine, he became bad. He didn't stop. He went on and he lost job. They slandered him and others. The other one that just died, Dr. Vladimir, what was his second name? Zelenko. He was threatened. He lost money. And when we see the, and he's, he was Jewish. I don't even know if, if Dr. McAuliffe even believes anything. Maybe, maybe he's not. I don't know. Never, I don't think he's ever shown anything religious. Atheists, Muslims, Jews, some Orthodox doctors, but these are secular people who are confessing the truth even though they've been threatened, they've lost money and things like that. And we as Orthodox are too cowardly to confess the truth just in case our priest does a little dada on your hand or something like that. And these people were persecuted badly. They were threatened, their lives. A lot of them had their licenses, their medical license taken away from them, but they didn't stop because they believed that. We have Orthodoxy. Now, COVID... Yes, there's COVID, the vaccines, which is a secular thing, but, but there is some spiritual significance to those vaccines, which I'll talk about another time. They're very bad. That's why the Holy Father, our, our elders and pious priests are saying, don't take them. And they are important. But it's just to me, uh, we're going to give word to God when we stand in front of him on the last day and he's going to say, did you confess the truth about orthodox? Not necessarily about the vaccines, in orthodoxy. Uh, uh, no, I was scared. But these people who are Bible believers, Jewish, Muslims, etc., um, they confessed the truth to do with the vaccine. And they went through a lot. And we have many, peop many examples of people who um, risked everything. Like those truckers in Canada, they risked a lot because they were against the lockdowns. And yet we can't speak up, again, uh, up for Orthodox because we're scared a bit. So people who are cowardly are threatened to go to hell. 
Some of us are cowardly from young. Some of us are cowardly because the demons fight us. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we ask God to give us courage. That's why in the prayers, if you read morning and night prayers, and, and uh, grant, O oh Lord, grant me courage. We miss these things. We just go on to other things like big fasts and no oils. So we go to the next one. This one is an unknown. But it's, I did see it over the internet. Quite, quite, a people, quite a few people were quoting it. When, but, I, but, but it's true. When one does not resist in a timely fashion, he gradually becomes incapable of ever resisting again. So if someone does not confess the truth, does not resist evil, <clears throat> leaves it, leaves it off, leaves it off, leaves it off, after he will or he or she will become incapable of ever resisting again. Once you go down that line, and that's what happened with a lot of the priests and bishops, they didn't resist evil. They didn't resist heresy. They kept on going, making excuses in their heads that what they're doing is good for the good of the church. We'll see about that soon. But it wasn't good for the church. It scandalized people. It made a lot of people fall away from the Orthodox Church. It was a big scandal. And they are responsible for those who were pro-mass vaccination. They were responsible for making many Orthodox Christians sick and many to die. They're responsible. Have they said sorry? No. It's all coming out now. It's all coming out that it was all crap. It was all lies. It was all uh, demonic, these shutdowns and all these things, people that are getting sick from the vaccines and dying. There's just From the last time I spoke to you, they did a study and they showed a list of countries that were vaccinated. So this country up there, the most vaccinated, down, 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 down. I think Bulgaria, which was the least vaccinated. Then it showed the increase in the death rate. Like usually they have that many deaths. But what happened was that the death rate has increased in many countries, 25% and more. And they put the list of those countries. Lo and behold, what do we notice? The countries that were the most vaccinated have the highest increase in the death rate and the country which had an increase in the population. What country was that? I said it before. What was the last on the list over here of the least vaccinated? Bulgaria. Bulgaria. Bulgaria was the country that not only do they have not even an increase in the death rate, less people are dying. So this weakness that we have needs to stop from all of us. We all have, we all have it. Now, sorry if I scandalise some because some are very judgmental. Anything that the priest does, it finds an excuse. Oh, look, he drank water while he was doing the talk. <laughs> Oh, he's fat. Oh, he's this. Oh, too much. <laughs> Better not to come. See, last time it was more people, a little bit more people. Where are they now? Less people today, but still a lot, but less. Why? There was a the novelty. Oh, let's go and see this unknown voice on the internet. Let's see who he is. And they come and they go, he doesn't look special. He doesn't look like an ascetic. He doesn't look like that. And he even drinks water while he's doing the talk. <laughs> I'm not coming anymore. That, you'd be surprised. They, that's how they are. Um, number five appetizer, St. Gregory Palamas, that died in 1359, but lives on in heaven. The silence of the clergy's atheism. I read that last time. Some of you weren't here last time. Some of you might have heard on the talk on the, on the um, internet. The silence of the clergy's atheism. So when I said last time, those who don't speak up are atheists. And people can say, how dare you say that? How dare you call the priests atheists because they didn't speak up? Maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because they had to pay their mortgages. So they didn't speak up. And they allowed people to die with the vaccines or they, whatever. They shut the churches down. That's silly. I'm, I didn't say it. There's, there's one of them. St. Gregory Palamas. The silence of the clergy is Atheism. 
And it's so obvious, even in this, in this COVID stuff, that they were saying that there were some churches around the world were using plastic spoons for communion. Some were sterilizing spoons. I told people, you will not take your children there. You will not go to a church where the priest is wearing the mask during the service and surgical gloves. And do not stand in the crowd while they are doing that because that's blasphemy and you should be very careful that the roof doesn't fall down and crush everyone. To actually say that the body and blood of Christ, you can get diseases. I said before, if anyone should be sick, it should be the priest because the priest or the deacon, after the, everyone's con you know, commune, commune, they could commune 100 people. That spoon goes in 100 mouths. There's people with AIDS, there's people with HIV, whatever, there are all these other things that they've got, hep, hep season, all that. What, what, what's the one that's dangerous? We've got a doctor at the back there. Hepatitis what? Which? Yeah, those ones. They're all contagious. Yeah, very contagious. And yet the priest then, or the deacon, if he's got a deacon serving that day, consumes the rest of what's in the chalice, the body and blood and the particles of income out, all consumed. That priest is more vulnerable to be sick. And yet, as I said last time, you will not go to a church where you hardly, ever, I've never known it, where you go for a Sunday, so they go, oh, sorry, Father so-and-so is not here today. He's got a cold. They should be, they should become all the time sick, but they're not. That's blasphemy, atheism, etc. St. John Maximovich, who passed away in 1966 and his relics are incorrupt, which is a sign of orthodox sanctity. Now, you might say, but others have relics that are incorrupt. No, no, not like the orthodox. St. Spiridon, as I said, because I knew the priest that was taking care of him, of the relics, he said that when they change his, like his black in there, because of the, the candelia, the um, oil lamps and the candles that get soot, but underneath his clothes, his body, he said, is still soft, warm, and pink. The others, they use wax, the Catholics use wax, etc. Catholics can't even do holy water. They've got to put salt in the water because it will go off. I don't think I even drink it because I'll be very thirsty after. <laughs> they actually, um, they just put, dip their hand in and just splash themselves. But the Orthodox holy water never goes off. That can only be done by an Orthodox priest. No one else can do a holy water service. Only an Orthodox priest, a canonical Orthodox priest, a priest of the Eastern Orthodox Church, not the Oriental Orthodox Church, Copts, Armenians, etc. They're not part of the church. They do not recognize the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh ecumenical council. Don't get confused because they dress like us. Don't get confused if they look pious and they bend their heads a bit. I'll do that for you if you want, but. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm it doesn't mean I'm holy, but they're not they're not the same as us. So St. John says that so his body is incorrupt. The time will come for true confession of the faith. All those who will confess will be alone and persecuted. Be alone. Many of you did feel alone and persecuted during the COVID time. Persecuted by who? Maybe relatives, friends, work. But who else? The clergy. Now, you might say, yeah, that's just overdone. Now you're saying that the clergy were persecuted. Of course not, but you know, they didn't. In Greece, someone just came from Greece and they said there was a church that said, you, unless you're vaccinated, you can't come in the church. Or no, things like, well, wear mask or this, or that. It's crazy. Orthodox Greece. Of course, you, people were locked, were thrown out of the churches. That's persecution. Number seven, St. Cosmas of Italia, whose name I was given when I was tonsured as a monk on his feast days on August 24. Things will come out of the schools that your mind does not even imagine. What things? Well, let me read you a UNICEF report, 13th of May, 2021. UNICEF released a report 
that proposes that differences in individual children's level of maturity and evolving capacities would come into play when creating an age rating system for regulating child access to sexually explicit content. In other words, the UN says porn, pornography, for kids is fine. So it's good, it's healthy. The United Nations thinks pornography is fine for children and that blocking it would infringe their human rights. The shocking claims were made in a report published by the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, and exposed on 30th of May 2021 by the Center for Family and Human Rights, CFAM, C FAM, a pro family lobby group of, at the United Nations. This is where it's going. And if you follow some things which some of you don't follow, you will know. Now, I, we put together on, the, on our website under videos and articles a section, five sections, section one, two, three, four, five. I'll tell you about them later, but I'll tell you about section five. Section five, I just put together now, because while we were looking for COVID articles, videos and articles, there were so many things I came across and we came across those who helped me that were really good, but that wasn't related to COVID. But then I decided, why don't we make a special section for those type of things? I'll read you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven titles that we got on that section five. The dangers of education. This is about a psychiatrist who was anti-homeschooling completely. But he said in the last few years, what he's seen is that, that they've been, that been taught in the school about transgender and all those type of things. He says, I would advise no one to send their children to school. Item 17, and that's happening here too. So items, but parents still, still send them. Item 17, if parents don't get a grip on their kids, Social media, trans activists will. So through their social media and all that, they're doing transgender uh, propaganda. You're a boy, you're a girl, you're not a boy, you're not a girl, you're this, you're it, you're whatever. There's all through all this. There's all, I think they've got about uh, one school's teaching or one university teaching eight genders. There's eight genders now. Oh, by the way, men can now get pregnant. I was really surprised. Such a, like a miracle. Men can get pregnant. But the only problem is that these men had women genitalia. So what's going on? They're up because they identify as men. They're women, but they identify as men. So now they're not allowed in these hospitals. And they're starting not to say mother anymore, but they're starting to say um, parent. They're using some other words so as not to offend transgender people. Sorry? Birth person. A birth person. Thank you. Yeah, but I read it, but I couldn't remember. Birth person. That includes people with beards. Because they take hormones. Um, number, item 18, video. It's a video. Drag queen teacher transforms classroom into LGBT nightclub. Item 21, because we have this problem with people, you, you, you know, the schools, oh, the state schools are so bad. No, you don't send them to the public schools. Christian schools, Christian schools, Christian schools. And they salivate while they're saying it. Christian schools, Christians, it's one that they don't choke. Why? Christian school. Let's have a look. A Christian school, high school in Manhattan, that's in New York, hosted mandatory drag show a drag show in place of church service. So the kids in this Christian school went for a service and they didn't have no service, but they had a drag show, drag queens, men that dressed up like women. Item 22, New Zealand consent laws under scrutiny after judge says minors can have consensual partnerships. So some guy got caught having sex with a child and he got off, I think, or I can't, I can't remember the full story, but because there was a law which says that if the child consents, then it's okay. Now, I did mention some years ago, I said, that's gonna go down the age. And people found it funny. I go, you'll see, it will go down. Just like I said, when I was a lay person in Melbourne, I was doing a talk 
I said about men wearing earrings. I said, well, now it's one ear. After that, it'll be two ears. People said, how can that be? They can't. That's women do two ears. That's man, the man's one ear. They wear two now. Another ringer in their nose. So, the age of consent is lowering because a lot of the politicians and those in power are pedophiles. So as, as, as such, they want to pass laws where they'll be able to do what they want with children without getting into trouble. So this New Zealand law allowed this man to go free having sex with an underage child. Item 26, Dr. Robert Malone, Malone, he was a doctor up there that that's also has been persecuted and slandered. He was working up with a lot of government in the government of America, like high oppositions. He says, don't send your kids to school, homeschool them, and he homeschools all his kids. He says it's just out of control. Item 27, distraught parents now face prosecution if they don't accept gender transition of their vulnerable kids. As experts slam radical new law based on ideology and false. In other words, they're passing laws that if you, if your child says that it's a boy but it's a girl and you don't, you don't support the child, if a priest speaks to the child and says, no, you're a boy when you know you're a girl or something like that, or you send it to a doctor, something like that, you can be prosecuted and go to jail. Because the child knew, from what I read, a child knows that they're transgender from the day they're born. The things that have come out of these people's mouths is just unbelievable. And the last one, to leave it off, it's, a, it's um, item 33. New Jersey in America, Department of Education vows, promises, to punish teachers if they refuse to teach their to teach children about gender identity, like I say, there's all different sexes and whatever you feel like, and anal sex. They forgot the oral sex because that's part of it too. That's been going on for quite a few years. And they've been doing these lessons in primary school. But people still send them to um, these schools. Why? Why would they do that? Because there's something wrong with them. That's why. How could you do that? How could you be a parent? In, you know, just think of it. How can you be a parent when you know that the children are doing Oh, because I have to work the downsize. Some people say, I, I have to do it because we won't be able to afford things as they get into their SUV or as they dive into their pools. We don't need those things. Those parents who homeschool their children in this day and age are holy. They're sacrificing. No good will come out of those who send their children to these schools. And worse than anal sex and all the rest of it is heresy. When you send your child to heretical schools like Catholic schools and to Protestant schools, so they can learn in the Protestant school that the mother of God is not mother of God, she's just Mary. And that Holy Communion is not the body and blood, it's just bread and wine. And that the, the Catholics, that the, Pope, that the Pope is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And so much more that they learn. But then you might say, oh, but isn't all those things about anal sex and all these dirty things, and all, isn't that worse than heresy? No, 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 no. no. Heresy is the worst. That's what the Holy Fathers tell us. Heresy cuts us off from God. Many of those kids that say they were, you know, it wasn't their fault that they went to these schools, a lot of them can come out. I'll give you an example. The pro-choice people, they got into the schools and they brainwashed the kids for decades about abortion. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good, pro-choice, pro-choice, yes, pro-choice. Didn't allow the pro-life arguments to be said in the schools, just the pro-choice arguments. And they did a really good job of brainwashing 
or children from as young as you can go. And what happened now in America? Well, the number of pro-life people have become more than the pro-choice people. And the feminists and all the other evil ones, they're saying, pulling their hair, the little that they've got, because they usually cut it short. Why? How did this happen? We did such a good job. And that's the same with homosexuality. It's the same with a lot of things. A lot of people now, now, the young people, I don't know what they call them, Zens, what, 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 what's the new group now? One of the letters in the alphabet, the ones that are recent, the ones that have gone through social media, the ones that have got all these ones here. They're saying that young kids today are more conservative than in previous decades. More conservative. In other words, they're against homosexuality, they're against pro-choice, they're against all these things transgenderism, things like that. And these are kids that were, in, that were in the schools and were brainwashed and also were on social media. However, when you look at any area in the world from our history of the church, of the church, where heresy came into the area and engulfed the Orthodox people, they didn't come back. It's very rare because heresy is disgusting and it's like, you know, some sticky stuff falls on you. You just can't get it off. You can't wash it off. That's the same as heresy. Very hard to wash heresy off you. Very hard. As I said, like in Lebanon and other areas in Syria, wherever these Catholics, whatever, Protestants, opened their schools up, those areas became... Catholic. They left orthodoxy. So there's a difference there. Communism is another example. The communists, 70 years of brainwashing, 70 years of the worst persecutions and brainwashing, especially Russia, was. Well, Albania was worse. But Russia was pretty bad. Romania was bad too, as we'll hear soon. And yet, and yet, what happened after all those years? Oh, the churches are being built again. They had a, they've got a president there who's orthodox, who is supportive of the churches. They, before communism fell, I think there was a um, certain number, but now it's, I don't know how many, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, priests and monastics. That's after 70 years of brainwashing. But what happens if Russia didn't become communist, but Russia became Roman Catholic? Well, the Roman Catholics took over and they started their propaganda. So the, the communists started their propaganda, which was atheism. Let's just say the Tsar was knocked out and in his place was replaced with a Catholic king or president. And they started their propaganda amongst the orthodox populations in schools, etc. What would have happened to Russia? Well, slowly, slowly, they would have become Roman Catholic. And what would have happened then 70 years later? We'll say they left. What would come later? They would remain Roman Catholic. They would remain Roman Catholic. That's how bad that is. And yet, I had a, a man and woman ring me up from Melbourne after the last talk. Oh, we'd like to come to the next talk. Is that okay? I go, okay, how many of you are? About nine. I said, okay. And you got any kids? Yes. How old are they? He goes, nine. No, no, don't want them to come because they're, they're too young and they're not going to be able to sit for five hours. I go, okay, well, they can stay with their cousin at the hotel. And we're talking about the vaccines and talking about this, having a very nice conversation. Fully, they said, oh, we agree with you, Father. We agree with you. We agree with you. We agree with you. And something said to me, ask him the following. Because I, I said, oh, sorry, I forgot. You don't send your kids to um, Catholic schools, do you? They go, oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, we do, unfortunately, we do, yeah. I said, why would you do that? Because, oh, it's too late now. Because they're old now. They're U11. I thought, why is it too late for? Why is it too late for? That's no good. 
So you're sending your kids to heresy, you're paying the Pope to teach them heresy. Not only are they teaching them heresy, you're paying them to teach them heresy with high fees. But have you heard my talks? They go, yeah. Have you heard me talk about that topic? Yeah, Nini, in all your talks, you always talk about it. But you still send them there because, yeah, we don't know what to say. I said, well, I'll tell you. I know what to say. I'll tell you. Number one, I won't be comfortable if you come. I don't want you to come. Don't come. Okay? And don't, uh, don't come remote and don't ring anymore, something like that, Clark. That was it. What an evil priest. Am I? I just told the fellow at the back, where is he? Yeah, here he is, a man at the back there. I didn't know he was even in the group. I said, if you're not orthodox, you can't partake of the olive oil and the, and the bread and do that. Most priests give it. They give it to anyone. So when I walked, he venerated the icons. That was okay. And he came past. I said, come here. And he goes, oh, no, I'm, I'm an inquirer. I said, oh, okay, well, you're welcome. But no, you can't take that. But you can take the icon. He goes, okay. And later on, we talked. No, I wanted to ask him. I didn't ask him. I didn't have to put you on the spot. Did you get offended? Oh, you didn't get offended. Oh, because we're told that, you know, you shouldn't do that because you can offend them. So we're going we're gonna to tread on the canons of the church so as not to offend the heterodox or things like that. No, that does him good. He has to see that orthodox is holy and you just can't willy-nilly just come in and walk in and get all that. But if that's the case, then you just don't become. And that's what priests are saying now. They even say you don't even have to get chrismated. They're the same, just come, come and commune. That's the stage it's got to. Though not a saint or an elder, the following renowned theologian said something over 20 years ago, which at the time was considered inappropriate, judgmental, horrible, but has now become true. And this is what he said. He's a very good theologian, very respected father, John Romanidis. He died in 2001. Quote, now the devil is on vacation because his work has been taken over by the Orthodox bishops. His work has been taken over by the Orthodox bishops. Not all of them. And please don't get there. Not all of them. The majority of them. As we saw, who could have done such a good job in the Orthodox Church? Even Fauci, if he came, wouldn't have been able to, and, and Gates and all the rest of them, them, they wouldn't have been able to accomplish what many of the bishops did all over the world, telling people to get vaccinated, and they did. And some of those um, documentaries about, you know, how the Jews and things like that were, you know, they, the, the, the Germans were amazed how they would just line up with no resistance and taken to concentration camps. They were just lined up. And they were really impressed by even the order that they had. They just, well, no one resisted. That's what happened now. It was amazing. People were lining up to get vaccinated because Father so-and-so said it. Or Bishop so-and-so said it. If you had a choice to listen to an ecumenist or a person that believes in covetism, that we can get sick from the church, so we call them covetists, like those who believe in ecumenism, that there's no true church of Christ, but we'll, when they all join, they'll be the church. Everyone's got a bit of the truth. They're called ecumenists because they believe in ecumenism. Now, those who believe in covetism, which is like a heresy, is a heresy, are covetists. If you had to listen to, say, your priest, father, say, John, a person that believes in covetism, or Father Christmas, who would you prefer to listen to? Personally, for me, I would listen to Father Christmas, for sure. And I even might even get a present out of him. <laughs> While the other guy is going to give you something, something different. It's going to give you heresy and a nice, big, fat COVID shot. Right in the arm. It's that bad.
this woman just here just told me that a friend of hers, a Greek woman, that she was at a church, and the priest was going, oh, and what was it, Eleni was like, Eleni, 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 you have to get vaccinated. Like you're watching a scary movie, like a voice. Eleni, Eleni, you have to get vaccinated. That's how bad it's got. Elder Justin Pavu, who died in 2013, was born in a village in Romania in 1919. In 1936, at the age of 17, he entered a monastery. In 1939, three years later, at the age of 20, he enrolled in the theological seminary in the Chernika Monastery. I don't know how to say Romanian things. But it's interesting because last week I said I'm against those theological schools. And a lot of saints also say the same. But there is a difference here in that he went to a theological seminary that was at least attached to a monastery, like in America, Holy Trinity Monastery, Jordanville, the Russian Theological Seminary, that's attached to the monastery. So the students live the life of the monks. That's better than going somewhere else. And a lot of theological schools, by the way, have heretics as teachers and atheists. Oh, because they know church history, then they let them teach. It's very, and they have students that are monophysites. So that's what's happening. So um, after his repose in 2013, his body miraculously gave off myrrh, which is a sign of a sanctity in the Orthodox Church. Regarding vaccines, as several saints and holy elders cautioned the faithful about the harmful effects even of some traditional vaccines. I'm going to talk about COVID, this is before COVID. The blessed elder Justin, who's not an Orthodox saint yet, Pavel of Romania, was one of these elders. Unlike the Romanian bishops of that time who said nothing, silence, which St. Greg Palmas says is atheism, he spoke up about the swine flu vaccine, which was at that time they were trying to push on the world with a few hundred cases of people that died from it. A few hundred, and they still tried to make it out of, it was a pandemic. He, he was saying, don't take that vaccine. As it turned out, these vaccines were deadly and the pandemic was fake. Now, I covered this in my, the article that we did online, which is under, um, when you see my name on the right-hand corner and you scroll down, there's on vaccines. There's an article there, 500 pages, 120,000 words that we put, put the effort together. People ring up and they want to speak to me and go, have you, heard, have you read the article? No. I haven't got around to it, but why are you ringing? It's all there. We went to all that trouble for, to do that article. Some of you, a lot of you read it, but some of you haven't. In there is a lot of information that you need to know as Orthodox Christians today. And um, in that article, in part two, there's a section which says, are there cases where traditional vaccines were mandated, forced on people in the past? Yes. And another one, and a holy elder and 60 minutes speak out against the swine flu vaccine. So an elder separate and 60 minutes even admitted at the end that it was fake and that the swine flu vaccines were dangerous. Part nine in that article is Dr. Wolfgang Wadag, physician, epidemiologist, and politician. He's, he's persecuted a lot too. He wrote a lot in there about the swine flu injections and the fake pandemic then, and he compared it to now. He is an authority on pandemics, and yet they knocked him off too. They just chucked him out of, the, um, of his position. So the Holy Elder was correct. Similarly, we also now seen that those clergy and doctors who spoke out against the COVID-19 narrative and vaccines were correct. Now, I'm going to quote what Father Justin said many years before COVID and all that. He says, our only weapons are spiritual ones, prayer, humility, love, but also confession. So he says, our only weapons as Orthodox Christians are spiritual ones, prayer, humility, love, but also confession. What does he mean by confession? Does he mean confession when we go for confession? What does he mean? Well, let's see. He goes on. You can't love without confession. Love is sacrificial, and if we fear to confess the truth, not confession of sins, he means confession, confession of the truth of the Orthodox faith. 
Love is sacrificial. And if we fear to confess the truth, what sacrifice do we have? Or if we do not care about our neighbor who is unaware and we do not inform him and we let him fall prey to the to this system, to the government system, etc., what love do we have? In other words, if there are people like what compelled me to do the vaccine article? What compelled? Because I saw people were being misinformed and people were getting sick and dying. I couldn't I couldn't take it anymore. Now, if I didn't do that, and I know that people were doing that, but I was quiet because I didn't want to get in trouble, which is possible, since I put a lot of them down, a lot of the big bishops that. Uh, I'm only fortunate that the bishop here is of similar mind. Imagine if they get rid of him and bring someone else here. But anyway, it doesn't matter. What happens if they defrock me? Well, what can I do? What happens if they suspend me? What can I do? People are suffering and getting sick, etc., and dying. That compelled me to say, I cannot do that. I was reluctant, not because I was scared. I was reluctant because I, I just can't do articles very good. I had to get a lot of help for them to do his work, but we put them all together. And he says here, if we don't care about our neighbor who is unaware, and we do not inform him, and we let him fall prey to the system, what love do we have? And yet people walk around and say, oh, I've got love, I've got love. Well, if you've got love, well, why don't you care about the people? They're in ignorance. For example, there, that book, does the contraception pill, that's hormonal contraception pills, not condoms, not this other thing, not that, those pills, whether they're patches, injections, etc. they're called hormonal contraceptives. So, we are now in the process of buying hundreds of them and spread them everywhere. Why? Because hardly anyone knows that the pills that they're taking are causing micro-abortions. People don't know that. And the clergy don't know it. Many clergy don't know that. So I know it because I came across it. So what do I do? Oh, yeah, that's it. And I say nothing. I say nothing. To sit there and um, do my prayers, the little that I do, you know, read a few canons of the saints, read the lives of saints, and that's it. Just take care of your... But I know that that's it now. I know that that's happening. So what should I do? Remain silent and become like an atheist? No. We've got to do something. So I also encourage people who have taken contraceptive pills and then they need to stop. And they want to repent. They've got to go and confess that they took contraceptive, these pills that could cause an abortion. And they probably have had abortions. Confess it, and then do some, what we say, fruits of repentance, offer fruits of repentance. What's that? Buy those books, spread them out. If you know something and you don't say anything, it says here, according to this saint, which is a saint, it was not canonized yet, you have no love. Those who will struggle today to awaken their brother, meaning their brothers and sisters in Christ, who have not remained indifferent to the future of a nation, meaning Romania, and the church, those who are the children of the love of God, who lay their lives down for their brethren, it is important to oppose all antichrists and die with dignity not have a, and not have a cowardly position. Don't have a cowardly position have courage. It says, oppose all Antichrist. Not the Antichrist, who well, is not here yet. But oppose the Antichrist, the forerunners. And those forerunners could be Orthodox clergy. That's, the, that's a fact. What do you want to do? To, to lie to you? It's happened in the past. Arius, who said that Christ wasn't God, but a created being, he influenced the whole 
Roman Empire at the time, apart from a few saints that were confessing the truth, like Athanasius and Ambrose of Milan and a few others like that. All the rest fell. They all fell and believed this good-looking, by the way, very charming. Iris was very charming, good-looking, ascetical. Ascetical, not like me. He looked ascetical. And he was gifted with the mouth. He could speak and he was able to influence bishops and priests and lay people throughout the whole of the empire. The whole empire fell into heresy. And what do the fathers call him? A forerunner of the Antichrist. Because what the Antichrist is going to say when he comes is the same thing. Christ isn't God. The time will come when you will be sold by your shepherds. Saint, Father Justin is saying, the time will come, and this is he said quite a few decades ago, the time will come when you will be sold by your shepherds, meaning the clergy, the orthodox clergy. They will sell you. What's he mean? They will watch you being ripped apart by the wild beasts and they will not come to your help. But who are the wild beasts? Well, it could be heretics, or they could be uh, government, etc. That are ripping, that are ripping apart the Orthodox Christians, and they sat there and said nothing, except from a few, completely nothing. Just think of that. Who spoke up that they were using plastic spoons? or sterilizing with methylated spirits the spoons in churches. Who spoke up hardly that the churches were closed? There were those who did, but the majority didn't. They sat there and said nothing. Know that these are th those times that are about to fall hard on us. At the end of an American film, it concluded with the message, microchip equals slavery. This is what it means, digital slavery. You don't live anymore. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You are the slave to those that own you. So he was against the microchip. Scientists, scientists that are coming out and saying it. They are saying that they're putting in his nano stuff. Well, it's all on, our, it's all on the website. St. Athanasius says if the bishop or, or the priest, who are the eyes of the church, behave improperly and scandalise the people, they must be deposed, defrocked, in other words. It is preferable for the congregation to assemble without them in the house of prayer than be cast out with them, as was Annas and Caiaphas in the gain of fire. So St. Athanasius, and this, this is where people read it and misinterpret it, you can't just take one verse of something without being in the, in, with the whole Orthodox tradition because you'll get confused. So here, people can take that and say, see, when the priest is bad and scandalizes and behaves improper, he must be deposed. And if you end up with no priest, then you go into a house of prayer, better to be without a priest than to have, um, to end up in hell. Now, firstly, St. Athanasius says it needs to be deposed and that means that the church might be left with no, with no priest or the priest might take the church, uh, the ex-priest might take the church over and just continue to be a priest so the people can't go there anymore because he's been defrocked. But St. Athanasius didn't say if that doesn't happen that the priest is not a priest, that he just automatically gets defrocked. It has to be done by a synod. And you might say, well, the synod can be corrupt. Well, that's correct. But they still don't work on their own. Canons do not work on their own. They need to be applied. And this is where people, and I'm going to show you later on, other saints that talked about corrupt clergy, etc., what to do. None of them said not to consider those people that are doing these things as not priests and run away, open up your own church, go over, stay at home, etc. This is in a different context. He says... They must be deposed. Well, if they're not deposed, then they're still priests. Regardless if they are doing the wrong thing, they're still priests. Or bishops. 
Now, back to that for videos and articles, I have... Um, uh, five sections. The first section is, is to do with Orthodox saints, holy elders and clergy about lockdowns, vaccines, etc. That's section one. Section two is doctors and others speak out about masks, lockdowns, vaccines, early treatment and COVID misinformation, etc. That is section two. So far, we are up to 1,200 videos and articles. We update it every couple of days. And then when you're there, when you go into that, you can't scroll down, it's just, it takes too long. Just go to a part which says, just underneath the heading says, for the latest updates, please click here. When you click there, it takes you to the end of the 1200. Then you work up. There's a lot of information there by reputable people. Section three, other beneficial orthodox videos and articles, which I believe is um, orthodox material, but not to do with COVID, just general things. Section four is just some um, articles and things that we've put together of different saints, their lives and things like that. And section five, which is what I read before, I read around seven, eight titles, beneficial non-orthodox videos and articles. That's about what's happening in the world today, but not on the COVID, COVID section two. And religious orthodox COVID information is a section one. So familiarise yourself with that. Now, in section two, I'm going to read quickly about six titles, just to show you the things that we put on there. Europe suffers horrifying 755% increase in excess deaths among children since the special vaccine for children. Since that was approved, children's deaths have gone up 755%. There's now advertisements on TV about to you check your child for heart problems what heart problems? Well, they're from the vaccines, but they're not going to admit that. Children are having uh, heart attacks, which never was before. And they can't. They're so stupid, or they think we're stupid. They want us to believe, oh, it's nothing it's not to do with the vaccines. And what's it got to do with it? It happened straight after. Cardiologists, honest cardiologists, that are not scared to say the truth, they're saying that in their practice, Children having heart problems started to increase from the time the vaccines came on the market and were given to children. Next one, video. Dr. Asim Mahotra, which is another person that speaks up, calls for a complete suspension of COVID vaccines. He's interesting because he was pro-vaccine. He was vaccinated. His father was vaccinated, but died later on. Uh, then he started waking up, and when he's, because he's a, he's a cardiologist, and when they noticed the autopsies of people that were dead, he noticed all this, the body full of spike protein. And then later on, he went from a pro-vaccine person to an anti-vaccine, but he's been persecuted too. He's a leading cardiologist in, in the UK, one of the leading. The leading one, the leading cardiologist, which I don't remember his name, he speaks against it too. Item 1189, FDA, that's in America. FDA vaccine advisor warns healthy young people should not get new COVID booster. 1184, undertakers in Australia are run off their feet with the high number of deaths and it's not just because of COVID, the disease. They're running out of space. They just can't keep up. People are dying much more than before. And when did this start? If we ask the undertakers, when did it start? Oh, it started when people started getting vaccinated. 1178, Johns Hopkins, Dr. Macari accuses CDC of the United States of sitting on data to suit their narrative. They had data which shows that this COVID was nothing more than a really bad flu. And they did not, and they were they falsified the data so that they can get, get across what they wanted. And what do they want? They want to depopulate the world and they want to control the world. And they're saying to themselves, we can't wait for Prince Philip to come back. Because we're not sure if reincarnation is true. We can't take the chance. We'll have to do it ourselves. 
If Philip comes back, that's good. But they still got Charles, and he might actually um, uh, get get together that military police of, of for, for the world. That's coming. There are countries where they're forcing people to be vaccinated. They hold them down and do that. So. Saint Nicholas, in his prologue, twenty fifth of October, he says. Among other mysterious perceptions by the holy souls of the saints, they could perceive, they could sense, discern, in other words, sweet fragrances from good spirits and foul stenches from impure spirits. A spirit that is pure and filled with light gives off a life-giving and fragrant scent, and a dark, darkened and impure spirit gives off a suffocating and unbearable stench. The saints were able to discern which passion possessed the man by the kind of stench he emanated. Those who were progressed spiritually, those who were holy, were able, when a person comes up to them from the smell of the soul, which they could pick up, a lot of people don't, they could tell if the person had the grace of God or was being bothered or under the control of demons. Thus it was, St. Nikolai goes on, thus it was that St. Ephthimios the Great recognised the stench of the passion of lust in a monk. Emilian, in the monastery of St. Theoctistos, going to Matins one morning, uh, Ephthimus passed by Emilian's cell and smelled the stench of the demon of, the, of lust, sexual passion. Emilian had not committed any physical sin, but he had, at that moment, lustful thoughts, which were being forced into his heart from an unclean demon, a demon whose presence the saint had already sensed by its smell within this monk. The power of this perception, St. Nicholas goes on, was even more wonderfully seen once in St. Ilarion the Great, the, in the life of him. A certain greedy man, a hoarder, a miser, had sent St. Ilarion some of the, his vegetables. When the vegetables were brought to Ilarion for a meal, the saint said, take it away, take, I can't stand the stench that's coming from these vegetables. Can't you smell it? It has the stench of avarice, greed. Avarice and extreme greed or desire to gain and hoard wealth, the desire is so great that it never gets satisfied. They just want more and more and more. When the monk, so why would he um, have, have given it to him? Who knows, he probably thought that he can get more, more things by the saint's prayers. When the monks marvelled at these words, Ilarion told them to take the vegetables and give them to the oxen and see if they would eat them. The oxen sniffed at them and turned their heads away in disgust. So even they couldn't eat it. Why did I bring that up? What's it got to do with um, COVID and heresies and things like that? Well, let's have a look. Saint Ephrem of Katunakia, newly canonised saint, 1998. He died, his feast day is 27 February. Saint Ephrem of Katunakia Manathos sent sins as stench. Once a bishop, through someone, asked the Blessed Holy Elder about ecumenism. The elder prayed for God to inform him. This is a special thing. See what it says? St. Paisius talks about that. I was informed by God. It was, it was a revelation by God. They were so holy that they could sense this. We're not. We can't be all the time sure that what we're feeling and thinking is from God. That's why we have humility. Ask God to help us, enlighten us, and, and, and maybe ask someone else, the spiritual father, if he's a proper one, Ask him, and from your humility, God will enlighten you. The elder prayed for God to inform him, and then he sensed a stench with a sour, salty, and bitter taste which filled him with horror. So in other words, when he thought about ecumenism, he smelt a disgusting stench. So in other words... Ecumenism stinks. It's a horrible, horrible heresy. And the majority of Orthodox churches from the top are in the World Council of Churches. St. Yakovos of Evia, who died in 1991, 22nd of November is his feast day, says the following himself. These are his words. Once a Protestant pastor 
I call them busters. That's a Greek cake. Once a Protestant pastor visited our monastery. When they informed me that this man is a priest of the Protestants, we approached him and took him on a tour of a monastery. Then I ordered that a meal be prepared for him. I did not sit with him at the table, but withdrew into my cell. For this is what the order calls for. What order? Isn't that rude? So this, this pastor came and the older left. So I show him around, give him to eat. But I'm going. I'm going to my cell. See? And what would the ecumenists say? Rude. Rude. Arrogant. Horrible. Where's your love? Because the ecumenists believe that they've got love. They hate the Holy Fathers, but they've got love. The ecumenists hate the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church. They hate the elders. And they hate the saints too, if it's contradictory to them. So if a saint says... Um, we shouldn't pray with heretics. The ecumenists will say, um, he was a bit fanatical. No, 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 fanatical. No, 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 no. We don't do that. I'm telling you now, and I'm going to tell you a story soon about someone that rang me up after the talk, last talk. He was a student of the theological college somewhere in the world. Maybe closer than what we think, but I'll tell you about him soon. What order? He says, this is what the order calls for. What? His order, his rule, and his monastery. Well, you'll see. The fathers, the holy fathers forbid the common prayer that precedes the common table with heterodox, with heretics, or with if anyone that's not orthodox, it's forbidden. But maybe that's just him. Father Ephraim, Elder Ephraim, Elder Ephraim, Arizona, Holy, Elder Ephraim. Everyone talks about Elder Ephraim. Elder Ephraim. Well, in his monastery in Philothel in, in Greece before he went to America, there was a sign on the door. Non-Orthodox are not permitted to sit at the table during the time that the monks are eating and listening to the lives of saints and during prayer before and after. They had to sit in another area. No, not that. He's a saint. He's this, he's that, he did miracles. Yes, that person. And his monasteries followed him. And the proper monasteries in Greece follow that same rule. Now, let's have a look here with Elder Yakovos. In another case, when a Roman Catholic stayed for the night at the monastery... The old, oh, by the way, in, in these monasteries, like Philothel, Father of Friends monasteries and all that, the non-Orthodox were not allowed to come in the church. They had to stay at the back in the, the back part. They were not allowed to get under the law. They were not allowed to be anointed. They were not allowed to have the wheat. They were not allowed to the qualifier. They were not allowed to have the five loaves like we had today. They weren't allowed. And there were many non-Orthodox which visited my office, Germans, Austrians, other countries, it's just when you go there, it's just so many non-Orthodox people that are going there. And I tell you one thing, when they leave, they, are, they don't leave the same people. And many of them convert from that. But the ecumenists say, how can they convert if they're being treated like that? But they do. Only some people here and there get upset. Very few. But if we go with the woke people now, is that doesn't matter if it's a minority, like if it's one transgender person, it's a male, but he thinks he's a female, and he identifies as a female, he can go in there into the girls' dressing sheds and dress in front of them because we can't discriminate because of one person. Same thing. Because one or two people might get upset, we're going to change what the Holy Fathers teach. We're going to say, no, we're not going to listen to the Holy Fathers. We've got more love. Let them come in. Let them have undidero. Let them have that. And even though, let them have Holy Communion too. Recently, in an Orthodox church somewhere, a priest proposed that we do a memorial prayer for Queen Elizabeth. 
a memorial prayer for Queen Elizabeth. And I wish the woman bad. You don't do memorial prayers for non-Orthodox. You don't commemorate non-Orthodox. You don't submit the names of non-Orthodox in malevolence, in paratresis, for uh, mimosima, for the dead. Um, we do not do any of that. How do we pray for a non-Orthodox departed person or for an Orthodox person that committed suicide, which cuts him off from the church, unless they were seriously mentally ill? The Holy Fathers teach us how to pray for them. The priest cannot commemorate them in the liturgy. The priest should not pray for them while he's wearing his liturgical vestments. This is only for Orthodox Christians. Father Seraphim Rose said that. St. John Maximovich said that. So how do you pray? You pray as follows. Lord Jesus Christ, according to your will, have mercy on him. In other words, if it's your will, have mercy on him. It's not your will, don't have mercy on him. That's it. But we don't say that when we're praying for Orthodox. We say, have mercy on their souls, not if it be your will. See the difference? This ignorance. So this priest said to the bishop, oh, let's um, commemorate Queen Elizabeth, like a memorial service. You can't do that. It's not Orthodox. If you care for her soul, then pray privately. Now, some of you want to submit names of non-Orthodox. Well, the way, well, number one, we have a akathist, which is the, the akathist to Holy Martyr Varus. That is an akathist written for those that have departed outside the Orthodox Church. That, that can be suicides too, Orthodox. That's number one. You can pray yourself for them, Lord Jesus Christ, according to your will, grant the mercy. You can also give them to, the, to a monastery, their name, where the, priest, where the monks, as monks, as monks, not dressed up in vestments if they're priests, as monks will pray for them privately. How do, they, how do the monks pray for them? Lord Jesus Christ, according to your will, grant them mercy. That's it. Now, another time, in another case, St. Yaakovos says, a Roman Catholic stayed it for the night at the monastery. The elder treated him with love. That's all right. Treat him with love. The visitor was a man of good will and had many questions. The elder was answering him with kindness and meekness. At the time, the monastery did not have the large table it has now, and everyone, monks, priests, and lay people, had to eat together at a small table on the ground floor where they were there, near the fount. Everyone had been preceded at the table and were waiting for the elder to come to do the blessing of the, for, for the food. When the elder came in, they all arose out of respect and so that the usual prayer before dinner could be, take place. The elder sat down and told the others to sit down. He made the sign of the cross and started eating. The Roman Catholic was faithful. He was a, like a, a believer in his, in, in, in his religion there. He took the initiative and said to the elder, Elder, shouldn't we pray first? And the elder replied, it's better to keep silent and continued eating. Let those who insist on common prayers with the heterodox understand the spirit of the saint. My question is, why with the pastor, he didn't sit with them to eat, why didn't do his cross, he left with the Protestant one. Both the Catholic, who wasn't a priest, he was a lay person, he sat down with him. What, what could the ecumenists get out of that? See, the Roman Catholics are closest with us. That's why the great elder sat with him and ate. He didn't do prayer, by the way, which is what they do. It seems confusing. Is that what it means? Who knows? Does it mean that? Does it mean that the Catholics are closer to us and that's why he sat down with them and ate, even they didn't do prayers? Well, I think the elder answered that. They're both the same. They're both heterodox. The difference is that the Protestant was a pastor 
and therefore he studied and he knows the history of the church and he knows better. He knows all about orthodoxy, etc. And he should know better. And if he had a good disposition, if his heart was proper, he would have converted from his study, like many other Protestants did, and Catholics, by the way, and converted to orthodoxy. But he didn't. And he wasn't asking many questions, if at all. But, see, the hint is where he says, where the saint says... The visitor was a man of good will. That's important. A good disposition. Wait a minute. Yeah, close the, the thing. The birds are disturbing us. What's wrong with them today? So it says that the man, it's called a good will. That's important. I always look for good will when I speak to people. If they're listening and they're attuned, I talk to them. But when they are talking over you and saying this and contradicting, not listening to anything, you walk away or you hang up. He said here, the visitor was a man of goodwill and had many questions. The Protestant didn't. The older was answering him with kindness and meekness. There was something there. And he was a lay person. He wasn't, a, like, for example, Roman Catholic clergy. They study, I think, theology for seven years. They know a lot. But they still remain Catholic. So not that he recognised Catholicism, not that he recognised that they were better than Protestants. No, no. He did do the same. He didn't pray with them. When I, because we're doing renovations at the monastery, I have workmen all the time, different religions, etc. And I would sit down with them. So what do I do? Do I stand there and do the prayer, say our Father, and then bless the food? And what, do I force them to stand? What do I do with them? They don't believe. That's, that's their business. And even if there's some orthodox Christians there, there are some workers that are orthodox. They go, are you going to bless the food? I said, no, no, it's all right, just do your cross. I do, the, I do my cross and I eat. That's it. That way I don't get condemned by the Holy Fathers on the last day for praying with heretics or the unbelievers. See how important it is? That's what you do. When you're at a situation where there are people that aren't believers, you don't force on them uh, uh, prayers like Pharisees. Just do your cross and that's it. Leave people free. Christ said if, if they want to follow him, they'll follow him. Don't force people. Now we come to what do we say about the parents who send their children to heterodox schools Protestant, Catholic, etc., Coptic ones, there's Coptic schools too now, to pray with them because part of the condition of going to these schools is you've got to partake in their services, in their, in their liturgies, their mass, etc., prayer and learn religious instruction and do prayer. And as I said before, they even pay the heterodox good money to teach their children heresy, to make their children pray, there with, with, with them, which is forbidden by the canons, and to participate in their worship. Many Orthodox children communed. They have to be chrismated. And once you participate in the, uh, the worship of another religion, you've got to get chrismated because you're an apostate. Now, you go to the priest, they'll say, no, no, you don't need to just confess. Yes, for, for lesser things, you know, You've done a prayer, something like that, that's wrong. But when we start participating in their worship, you are being initiated into their religion. Like a woman who told me she went to somewhere where there's Hindus. She went into those um, ashrams, whatever they're called. I said, what did you do there? She goes, oh, we did prayers and bowed down to the little statues and we offered things. I said, so you participated in a pagan service? She goes, yeah, chrismation. She's preparing now for chrismation. What is your problem to simply observe? Is observing the same as participating? Why do you have to observe? But is it the same as participating? Not really, but you open up the doors to go further because then you become to uh, sympathise with them. So it's the well, it says whoever goes into the church to pray. Now, if you're not going in there to pray, then it's not the same, is it? However... 
after a while, the devil will come along and will, we'll, you know, look, that's nice, that's not. Nice. Here, I'll give you an example. There's a girl who used to go to youth groups, to an orthodox youth group. And the teacher of that youth group was um, going to, she was going to leave. She was finishing up. She taught them for a few years. And she was an ex-student of a Catholic school. She went to a Catholic school. And as she was getting emotional and saying goodbye to the girls and, you know, and she goes, I think back at my school days and I remember the songs that we sang with the nuns and, the, and she was getting all emotional. She didn't say anything about orthodoxy. She didn't say the trepario of the saints, participate in the body and blood, none of that. She was becoming emotional over the songs they sang at the Catholic school. Saint Innocent of Moscow, who was the enlightener of Alaska, he, in his life, it does say he visited a Catholic church to observe, not to participate. But he's a saint, he was a great man, and um, he didn't fall into the, into the trap. But believe you me, as my deputy used to say when I was in high school, believe you me, after a while, you will fall. Like those people that go to these dialogues with the monophysites, they go to dialogue to find some way to unite. 80 million are in the world of monophysites. 80 million would be fantastic, the greatest thing for those people to become orthodox. But they stubbornly refuse to accept the fourth ecumenical. And they even have as saints people who we condemned in the Orthodox Church as heretics. They've got them as saints, like Severus. Dioscoros and all these people, they've got them as saints. They're not going to give them up. But that would be the greatest thing for that to happen. So they do in dialogue. And John, isn't it? What, what's your name? Yanni, yes, John. And what happened, John, with these people is after a while, they said, as they were doing these dialogues with these people, that, the, that after associating with them, praying with them, being friendly with them, exchanging gifts, etc., that the fourth ecumenical council was a mistake. It was a question of uh, the language, because they spoke in a, you know, a cop, cop language, the Greek spoke Greek, and there was a thing, even though there was a miracle of Saint Ephemia, that doesn't matter. And even though we know from the past that Saint John, Saint Ephraim the Syrian was enlightened to understand Greek and speak Greek when he was speaking to St. John Chrysostom because he spoke Syrian. And when he went, when he went to meet St. John Chrysostom because the noble, he's prayed and he says, I wish I can understand, I wish I can talk to this great man. And then God enlightened him, he's speaking Greek. So we have all these examples. St. Paisius also understood people of different languages if you read his life. Did they pray with them? And they would, they would these Are you a theological student, well, by the way? No, I'm not. Okay. But they would, they would create these we have we have I'm coming to that now. There was no mistake. If God wanted, he could have enlightened them. And that's why he gave the, the miracle of St. Ephemia. But they, they, the monophysites didn't accept it. Now, we go back to the, those apologetics you're talking about. We go back to them. Many of those pyrarchs who in the beginning went for good reasons to speak to these people to bring them back to the church. St. Mark of Ephesus did that as well. He went to speak to the Catholics, etc. And many of the others went there for the same reason. But slowly, 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 they all betrayed orthodoxy except for him. He wouldn't sign. But he was a giant. These people are not giants. They are administrators. There are bishops who are more like administrators. They don't have that spirit that the Holy Fathers did. And even though some Holy Fathers even fell into heresy and then they repented. So that's how hard it is. It's sticky. It's very, once you get it on you, it's hard to get it off. And they betrayed orthodoxy. And now they're saying, no, 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 the Fourth Ecumenical Council, that was a mistake. 
So it's not the problem of the, John, it's not a problem of having a dialogue. The problem is you don't pray with them. They do. Number two, you don't betray orthodoxy. They do. And number three, to have a spirituality which is a giant, to be on fire with the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Fathers were. These people, they're not like that. And that's why slowly, slowly, they lost themselves. Does that satisfy you or, or that doesn't really satisfy you? See, the problem with you, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude, but because you come from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, yeah. you've been contaminated. So you've got all this sticky stuff on you. Why? 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 Is that because is it because I'm special? Some of them. I'm just an ordinary fat person. Why? 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 What's special about me? So, well, um, what makes me different is that I quote the fathers. What makes them different? Oh, look, since we're on the topic, so this theological guy rings up and he was going to a theological school closer than what we think. So he rings me up to say that he did a, a lecture PowerPoint presentation about um, COVID vaccines, he was trying to convince the bishops of his area, it was, uh, maybe five, six bishops there, he was trying to convince them. And he goes, and Father, they didn't listen to me. They didn't listen to me. They don't understand. It's no good, these vaccines and this and that. I go, wow. So this guy's got a lot of zeal. Very good. And he's going on and on and on. Somehow then, I started saying to him, why are you going to that school for? Because I'm learning theology. What theology? They don't teach theology. They teach heresy. They don't believe in the Holy Fathers. They blaspheme the Holy Fathers. They say that the others have mysteries. They say that the, that the Pope is equal to the, to the patriarchs of today of the Orthodox Church. They say that the Fourth Amendment Council was a mistake. They say, they say, they say. Not once did he say to me, no, they don't, which means they do. He was oof, enlightened. The wisdom was pouring out of his head and through the phone because I was on the phone. And after he talked about the vaccine, which was good, then he went on to theological things. And he says, similar to what we just heard, uh, but, but, but this, but that, and this and that. I said, what? see, I said, see how you're contaminated? And I said, uh, we don't pray for heretics. But they condemn Christ for going to the sinners. I said, where do you get this stuff from? Is this from the Holy Fathers or is this from the make up the name George? He goes, a bit from George and a bit from the Holy Fathers. So this idiot, this poor person, was putting himself on the same level as the Holy Fathers. A bit from the Holy Fathers and a bit from George. He talked about himself, in other words. And plus his spiritual father, who's a doctor, was telling him that he should get vaccinated. So I said, George, 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 just stop, stop, stop. I said, you're talking over me. I can't, I'm not going to argue with you. I haven't got time. Listen. Two bits of advice. One, go for another spiritual father because the one you guys are heretic and he's an ecumenist too. And number two, get out of that theological school before you lose your soul. Pluck! And that was it. Are you shocked? Is it rude? Read the lives of saints and you'll see that what I've said is not rude. Father, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, you talked about the sticky stuff, like once, some, once you have the sticky stuff on, mm -hmm. it's hard to get it off. How does a patriarch, for example, who's an ecumenist, justify to himself that what he is believing and is sprouting is correct when he really knows the truth? How does he justify to himself? Because you can con people, but he knows he's conning God and betraying and leading a lot of people astray. Saint. Paisios says that when someone treads on their conscience, after a while, the conscience becomes poromenal, which is in Greek, becomes hardened, and they can't come out of it. Hard as a rock. They've got no conscience. Okay. Really? It's dead? A lot of it is dead, yeah. Now, 
up to when were they able to still come out of it? I don't know. Whether they've gone past that, thank God knows. But St. Pai used to say, the more that, and as the other one says, when you don't resist evil, after all, you can't resist at all. These people sound more like um, environmentalists, vaccine um, um, uh, people, uh, what, what do you call them? Pfizer reps. Fiber visor reps and things like that. They don't sound like bishops anymore. One patriarch was uh, uh, took pictures of him planting trees because he's now an environmentalist. There's nothing wrong to be care about the environment. St. Cosmas talks about the environment. St. Paisha talks about the environment. That's not the point. But not at the cost of you throw all everything orthodox away. Father Epiphanius Thodoropoulos, a Greek confessor in Greece, he's the confessed people, very holy person. We have his book at the back, Councils of Life. Excellent. A woman came to him and says, Oh, Father, well, my daughter had to have an abortion because she had sex, you know, and she wasn't married, and it's uh, resili means embarrassment, and there's nothing else we could do. And he stood up and he threw off the petri, what he's wearing. He said, No, no, I'm not going to agree to this. And he took it off and he left. That's rude? No. Because what she was doing, she was going, Father, that's. And she had to do it. And she, she was not the thing to do like that. And what do a lot of priests do? Um, I understand and forgive, and that's it. So the parents today are paying for their children to go to these Catholic schools and Protestant schools, and they will give word. It's forbidden. If Elder Yaakov was, didn't even do prayer, and Elder Frem, and all the other saints would not even do one prayer with the heterodox, how much more to participate, not to observe, which I still wouldn't agree, I wouldn't advise it, but not to participate at all in anything. And also they're forced to say the creed and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. They say it the wrong way. That's heretical. We have th thousands and thousands of saints that died to keep the creed. Intact. So what happens now? Oh, oh, I didn't even know. Um, I don't, I, sorry, yes. The alternative of public school where they're talking about transgender and safe schools? Well, firstly, we have to realise which is worse, heresy or that. So we've established heresy is worse. So that's out of the question. The second thing now is the public schools. I said that um, people are coming out of the public schools defiled, but there's chances they can get out of it. And that's why we saw in Russia and now with the, the... And even with the transgender movement, you'll see after a while, a lot of young kids are going to reject it. It's, it's in their conscience. So it's not the same as participating in worship, but it's still wrong but there's still a chance that those people will come out of it. But why send them there in the first place? If there's a chance, what happens if they don't come out of it? Number, number two. Number three, I read, I read a letter to Elder Ephraim's monastery to ask, what did the Elder Ephraim say about schools? Is it better to go to, to, go to a uh, religious school or a state school? And I got the answer, which was fantastic. Neither, homeschool, just homeschool. That, that, that was the Elder's mistake. Don't go to about any of them. Just be homeschooled. Now, some of you might be smart and say, but what happens if you don't? Everyone's got to examine their own culture. I'm not here to examine your culture. I feel if you want me to, I can sit down and ask you questions privately, and we'll see how much money do you have, how much equity do you have in your house, can you afford it, what, what type of thing it is. Like today, oh, Father, they ring up. Oh, oh, there's nothing I could do. I had to get injected for my family. So in the lives of saints, that, that they, didn't, they didn't compromise. They didn't compromise, and we glorify them. We kiss their icons, etc. pray to them. But at the same time, we say it's okay to compromise for reasons that we just said, for whatever, money, for this, for that. doesn't make sense. And remember, the vaccines are all linked to the fetal cells. That's just one thing. But we have our elders, not patriarchs and bishops, elders who in unison say not to take the vaccine. Not because I say it. And not only that, 
even we have doctors in the world that aren't even elders, they're medical, maybe you can call them medical elders. They are against the vaccine. Good doctors that have been persecuted. We're going to learn later on from St. Ignatius Benchinov in his arena book that he says that pre proper people will get persecuted. Those who are following God will be persecuted. Or maybe we can maybe have a little bit of a similarity. Those who are following the true medical science will be persecuted too. So we've got much, much more to go. That's, um, we're not going good today for the, for the quantity, but anyway. Uh, but for order next time, Jonathan, we, John, we want people to put their hands up. That's because I know you're used to it from your church. Here, no one calls out. You put your hand up, and if I'm in the mood, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge you to speak. But if I'm in the middle of a thought, I'll come back to you later. But no one is to call out. When, this is not the Greek archdiocese. I don't like that. I never liked it as a teacher, and I don't like it now. It's disorder. St. Paul says there must be order. If everyone starts calling out, what's going to happen? Or people bring their kids in, they're running around, the priests just sit there and just keep talking, and the kids are playing, running. How are people going to concentrate? They're humble. They're humble priests. See, they take it because they're in prayer. And I said once to a priest, there's all these people walking around, goes, oh, if you were praying, you wouldn't even notice it. All these satanic type of excuses because people are weak. That's a weakness. So if I sat here and allowed people to run around, call out, etc., would you be able to concentrate? No. That's why you come, because you appreciate the order. You appreciate it. I had a couple, they're catechumens in America, they wrote to me, and I told them to go to church somewhere, and I said, go, go to that church, I think um, the priest is really good. They went there, and they were scandalized because the priest said nothing, and people were walking around and talking while he was doing the sermon, they couldn't hear, and they were shocked. And they go, oh, Father, the, he doesn't tell them anything like you do. That's why on purpose, I leave in the recordings when I tell people off. I do on purpose. So people can hear and know that is the right way. You do not allow disorder. On that, you're welcome to the sam sandwiches. Those who want to escape from Alcatraz, they're welcome as well. Have the sandwiches for the trip, but okay, quickly now. Do for ten minutes or something. Our friend at the back, what's your name again? Domna. Is that right? She's very interesting. She was part of the Syrian church. Assyrian. Assyrian. And if I'm correct, Assyrian church is one of the Oriental Orthodox, is it? They're on the Ah, oh, Nestorian. It's, as, so the Nestorians don't recognize the third ecumenical council. The Monophysites don't recognize the fourth ecumenical council. So anyway, uh, she came to Orthodoxy, which is good. And um, she said that when she was here last time, there were some people that she overheard and also the bookshop that she goes to, that there are people that are running to this bishop. Is he a bishop? A bishop of the... Well, well Father, he's actually he's cut off from his church. Oh, he's cut off even, right. So there's, yeah, there's an ancient church of the East and he's cut off from there. So okay, he's what? He's essentially schismatic from his own church. And what was his church? Um, so the ancient church of the East. Ancient church. Yeah, uh, the, Syrian, ancient. What do they believe? Who knows? It doesn't really matter. It's not. It's not orthodox. But he calls himself orthodox, does he? Yes. Did, did they call themselves orthodox? He says orthodox. Yeah. yeah. So what? Is she, this. What was overheard? And people. That, and I've heard this from others that have rang me up too. That there's. Oh, there's this priest up in Wakeley near Fairfield, and bishop, and he talks against COVID, and people go to his church. Now, I'm sure the man has zeal, 
probably got a lot of guts too in speaking up, etc. But he's not orthodox. Now, you might say, well, what's the difference between listening to him or listening to Dr. McAuliffe? Well, McAuliffe is not talking about religion. The people, this man is a heterodox. He's not part of the orthodox church. I'm not going to refrain from talking about things that are not right because it doesn't sound nice. I said, he might be a nice person, but he's not orthodox. And people go to his church, listen to the sermon, which is okay if it's just COVID, but you can't go into the church because he's doing prayers, etc. And he's talking about religious things too. So why don't people come here, for example? I'm talking against COVID. Why don't they come here? I'll tell you why. Why aren't the orthodox people coming here? And the answer is because it's orthodox and they want to go to where there's heresy. Their souls are inclined to heresy. It's as simple as that. That's why they don't come here. From the Spiritual Meadow, which is a book by St. John Moscus, St. John Moscus was born around 550. He was a Byzantine monk and a Seroko writer. He's commemorated together with St. Sophronius of Jerusalem on March the 11th. Now, this is what he writes in his book. We once paid a visit to Ava Kiriakos, the priest at the Lavra of Kalamon on the Holy Jordan River, and he told us this story. Now, Ava is similar to what we say, Kieronda in Greek, Elda in English, Staritz in Russian. So when we read the word Ava, they're usually referring to the fathers from Egypt, Palestine. One day in my sleep, I saw a woman of stately appearance dressed in purple, and after her, I saw two reverend and honourable men standing outside my cell. It seemed to me that the woman was Our Lady, the Mother of God, and that the men were with her were Saint John the Divine, that means the Apostle, and Saint John the Baptist. I went out of my cell and inv invited them to come in and offer a prayer in my cell. But she would not agree to my request. So Ava Kiriakos himself, he's talking about himself, what he saw. He had a dream and he saw the Mother of God, and in the dream, he said to her to come into my cell where he lives. Um, I went out of my cell, invited them to come in and offer a prayer in my cell, but she would not agree to my request. The mother of God said, I'm not coming into your cell. I persisted at some length, begging her and saying, oh, let the simple not go away ashamed, Psalm 73, 21, and much else. When she realized that I was persistent with my invitation, she answered me coldly. The mother of God answered coldly. And yet people say the priest shouldn't be abrupt. The priest shouldn't be cold or something like that in certain things. The mother of God was cold. Why? Let's have a look. When she, when, when she realized that I was persistent with my invitation, she answered me coldly saying, the mother of God said, how can you ask me to enter into your cell where you have my enemy in there? With these words, she went away. You have my enemy in there. When I awoke, said the elder, I began to worry and to wonder if I might have offended her in my thoughts, for there was nobody in the cell but me. He says, who's, who's, your, who's her enemy? Oh, there's no one in there. I examined myself at some length, unlike a lot of Orthodox Christians today that don't examine themselves. Part of us being orthodox is we examine ourselves. Are we doing the right thing? Sometimes people just don't think about themselves. They don't have self-knowledge. I examined myself at some length and couldn't find no fault which I might have committed against her. There are certain mental illnesses and one of them is that the person does not have self-criticism. They can't look at themselves. They can't examine themselves which probably is linked a lot to pride as well, because the proud don't want to look at themselves. I noticed that I was about to be overcome with remorse, guilt. 
was going to become hopeless. I rose up, took up a scroll. I could, in those days, that was their books, it was a scroll. Intending to read it, thinking that perhaps reading would alleviate my distress. That's a good lesson for us. When we are in distress, we should read spiritual books. That helps us. But instead, we go and do films or read worldly things or go out. Nothing wrong with some of those things, but the best, as St. John of Cronston says too, is to alleviate your problems with prayer and with spiritual reading. It was a book I had borrowed from Ezekiel, a priest from Jerusalem. So he took up this, we'll just call it a book, it was a scroll, but we still took a book that was given to him by another holy person. I untied it and found two writings of the irreligious Nestorius. What a coincidence, written at the end of it. And immediately I knew that he was the enemy of Our Lady, the Holy Mother of God. In other words, the book was completely orthodox, the scroll, the parchment, all orthodox. But at the end, there was two quotes from Nestorius who was condemned in the Third Ecumenical Council for saying that the Mother of God gave birth to a human, not to God-man that she just had someone special, like one of the prophets, one of the, one, something like that. So I rose up and went off and gave the book back to him who had given it to me. And I said to him, take your book, brother, for I have received from it more trouble than benefit. Yes, there was good things in there, but there was heresy. Milk, nice glass of milk. Looks nice, white. And you'd like to drink it, like really refreshing milk. There's a couple of drops of poison in there. What's going to happen? Well, if it's strong enough, you're going to die. So this book that he had was all orthodox, orthodox, orthodox. Oh, two quotes from Nestorius. When he asked me how it had caused me trouble, I told him what had happened. When he had heard about it all, he immediately cut the writings of Nestorius off from the scroll and threw the piece into the fire, saying, The enemy of Our Lady, the Holy Mother of God, shall not remain in my cell either. Why am I doing all these heretical things today on ecumenism? Because last time I spoke more on covetism, not much on ecumenism. Someone said that, oh, you didn't speak much about ecumenism. He's like, well, I'm making up for it now. That's so why I like getting feedback. The enemy of Our Lady, the Holy Mother of God, shall not remain in my cell either. And yet at ecumenical gatherings where they do prayers together, who are also present there? Nestorians. Nestorians are present. And sheikhs and Jews and Muslims. Are we supposed to hate those people? No. But we're not allowed to pray with them. We're not allowed to participate in their services. Then someone asked before, I think it was Georgina said, I think it was you, then why do they do it? Is that what you said? Why would they do it if they know? Well, my, and my answer to you is, if you saw a blind man walking and he fell down, would you, would you say, he did on purpose or that he's uh, stupid or something? No. no, he's blind. They're blind. They are blind. And you know what? I used to say they're worse than bats. No, sorry, they are like bats. But I've changed my mind now because I read that bats can have good radar and they can, um, they can see they can, through their radar. These people have lost everything. Now we go to another one. The virtuous monk who held a disgusting faith. What's going on there? So this is also from St. John Moscus. This is what I was trying to say to our friend. I don't know if he's still here. Are you still here, John? I was trying to say before, this is not being taught now in a lot of Orthodox churches, these things. 
they find these books backward. St. John Moscus, little stories, and no, we're not interested in that. We're going to do theological things, great things. This is the story, the story of Ava Theodore about a monk from Syria. And now, here, I've got it here. So we say Ava for Mother or Yerondisa. I don't know in Russian how you say star, it's in houses. Anyway, it's Ama. So Ava is Yeronda, elder, and Ama is mother or eldress, Yerondisa. Ava Theodore also told us the following. One day, the man in charge of a guest house invited me to go and stay there for a few days. When I got there, I found that one of the guests staying there was a monk from Syria who owned nothing except a hair shirt, a few loaves of bread. Hair shirt means that he wore a shirt, a shirt made out of hair, which was really itchy. And people used that as a facetical. They used to bleed. So they were ascetics. So why don't we do hair shirts? Do I have a hair shirt? No, I've got a nice cotton shirt on because I'm allergic to synthetics. So I wear cotton. But that means you're not an ascetic. I don't claim to be. I don't claim to be. Why would I do that? Why would I wear a hair shirt? So I can get proud. Well, why'd they do it? The, the, the holy people. Because they had already reached a high level of humility. So they were doing this additional thing of fasting and uh, sleeping on the ground, etc., etc. They had already reached a high level of humility. Today, people don't even know what the word humility means. And they're doing, they, they read books and they try and do the same thing. And they go around in the world with blood on their back from their hair shirts. But they're um, deceived. Yes, these saints did do that. But they had already reached. Some of them went out and uh, kept silent. They stayed out and in the sun or in the snow. But they had reached a high level of humility. We have not reached even a little bit of humility. And people want to live like that. Anyway, so this monk... He owned nothing except a hair shirt and a few loaves of bread. So, and we have many saints that did that. They, were, they gave up everything, no material things, suffered with their hair shirts, ate only a little bit. He was standing in a corner saying psalms day and night. That's another big thing. Can we do that? Well, I can't. And speaking to no one, even had the gift of silence. So he was had the gift of silence. He was praying day in and day out. He stood there in the corner, not sitting down, and he had a hair shirt, and and he ate only a little bit of bread. And we have saints that, that were like that. When Sunday came, I approached him, says Ava Theodore. I said, come with me, brother, to St. Sophia. That was St. Sophia of Constantinople, a church called St. Sophia, which was... Um, um, close to where this guest house was, so that you can partake of the holy and venerable mysteries. He said he would not come, so I asked him why not. I am a follower of Severus, and I do not commune in the Orthodox Church. Now, Severus was a monophysite who rejected the Fourth Ecumenical Council, more on him in a minute, and the monophysites. He was not part of the one holy Catholic apostolic church. He rejected the fourth ecumenical council, which was later on reconfirmed in the fifth and the sixth and the seventh said, anathema to whoever doesn't follow what the fourth ecumenical council says. What did they declare? We'll see in a minute. So it's enough to say he's a heretic. He wasn't part of the church. So he didn't want to commune. Even though today, now they've changed, now they've lied, now they're saying, Oh, monophysites can come and commune and orthodox can go to them and that, 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 these, these agreements that they do. If you see a, a monophysite communion in your church, you shouldn't go to that church. You tell the priest, did you know he was a monophysite? Don't be rude, be very polite, respectful. I can't come to the church if you're going to be communing uh, heterodox. If he says no, I'm going to uh, continue and say, yasu, bye-bye. I'm being told that he would not commune in the Holy and Apostolic Church and yet being aware that he seemed to have an excellent way of life 
full of virtues. I went away grieving to my cell and shut the door. By the way, those people that were scandalized when I sent them to that church because everyone was talking and they were, they wrote a letter to the priest very, very nicely. And the priest told the people what had happened and told the people off for what had happened and said that people were scandalized. That was good, see? It was done nicely. Now, this Ava, this elder, um, he was a bit confused because this monk from Syria had an excellent, that's the way he described it, an excellent way of life, full of virtues. And I went away grieving to myself and shut the door. I prostrated myself before God for three days and prayed with many tears. Why was he upset? What made him upset? Now, there's two scenarios. The first one, which can be used by the ecumenists, the elder was upset because he wanted the ascetic to commune in the Orthodox Church, even though he was a heretic, and even though um, he believed in Severus, who was anathematized by the church. That's what the ecumenists can say. Because the elder says, look, look how holy his life was. He had an excellent way, full of virtues. He prayed day and night. He stood continually. He had a hair shirt. He had a bit of bread and water. This man was virtuous. That's what people say when they look at the Copts and other heterodox. They say, wow. And they do. Oh, they fast a lot. They fast, I think, more than the Orthodox. They're really big fasters. And they look very virtuous. So that's one argument. So, in other words, for that first argument, I forgot to say that if he's leading such a holy life, he must have the grace of God. What does that mean? If he's got the grace of God, he's doing all these virtues, then perhaps Severus was wrongly accused. Maybe the church made a mistake and condemned him. Maybe the, the ecumenical council which condemned that heresy of Severus was wrong. There's no way that this man cannot be holy after he's doing all those things. What did he do? Hair shirts, some bread, a bit of water. I have eight glasses. I try to have eight glasses a day, so I wouldn't be classified as an ascetic because they, ascetics only had a little bit of water. And uh, they ate a little bit of bread. I assure you, I just don't eat bread. He stood all day. No, can't do that either. It's very hard for me. And he was praying with tears. Sometimes it's hard to get a little drop from me. Sure, you have the same problem. Actually, the saints that wrote the, the, wrote the service books would say, I'm dry, I'm please grant me some tears and things like that. They used to say the same thing. The second explanation may be that he's upset that he's not part of the Orthodox Church and that his soul and those who follow Severus' heresy will be lost. That's another explanation. Because you looked up to him. So my question... I pose to people is what is what what's he crying about? Well, if we go on with the story, we'll see. And then the elder said, um, "I prayed as follows: Christ, our God and ruler, who of your immense and ineffable mercy turned from heaven and came down for our salvation, who became flesh of our most holy Lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, show me." Who has the right and proper belief? Us, the Orthodox, who belong to the, Holy Ch to the Orthodox Church, or those who follow Severus? Now this, one can say, is like blasphemy. He had doubt. This great elder had doubt because when he saw this man, how he was virtuous, in inverted commas, knocked him around and he's a an avar he's a ascetic and he got confused so if he gets confused 
then what's going to happen to those bishops who have contact with these heterodox and talk with them and pray with them? They're going to say, oh, the fourth ecumenical council was a mistake. That's why we're not supposed to have association with those of other faiths. But what does that mean if you live in Australia? They're all around. We work with them, they're at school, etc. If, if those who are still at school, what happens then? I have association with them at the monastery. We're doing work. There's people there, unbelievers, Catholic, this, that. What do we do? I even had a Muslim. He used to be a Muslim. Then he became an atheist. So he was an atheist Muslim. But he said, if he was to change, you'd become orthodox. What do you say that for? Because you were preaching to him. No, I didn't preach to him at all. I was just nice to him. And he goes, if, if I was ever to change, I would become orthodox. My friend, when before I changed, I changed around 25 years old. So I had a friend. He was Catholic, but he, he wasn't religious at all. He said, he said to me once, later on when I became religious, I stopped hanging around with him after that because he was on drugs and things. And he, he said to me, if God is so great, why does he want people to worship him? Those stupidities. Where did he get that from? The demons inspired him. Just stupidities. I didn't tell him off. It's just like I knew he was just confused. Anyway, I said to him, um, I said to him, let's make up a name, Michael. Say, Michael, look, I did some talks, because I was still a lay person then. I did some talks in Melbourne, and they're all on cassettes. Back in those days, the cassettes. I said, would you like to listen to them? And he said, okay. So I gave him the talks, and then he listened to them. I was surprised. I'm really surprised. This guy had not one ounce of anything religious at all. I don't think, I think the last time he went to the Catholic Church, probably when he was baptised by them. Uh, and I said to him, so what did you think? And he said, I can say from what I heard and the way that, that the Orthodox Church is the true religion, but I can't convert because I can't give up my life. In other words, he wanted to continue having drugs and sex outside of marriage, etc. But he said that. Another guy, Catholic, was married to an Orthodox. These Lebanese, they mix, 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 mix marriages. And uh, he, when I used to go, they used to say, oh, the Orthodox and the Catholics, these are always, always they say stupid jokes. I went there to buy tiles. But during the process, I had to listen to him making jokes about the Orthodox and the Orthodox and the Catholics are better. And I, I said, can I ask you something? I think his name was James, and he wasn't a chauffeur. I said to him, can I ask you a question? Because he says, I, I go to Orthodox churches for marriages. Because as I said, the Antiochians, whew, they mix weddings, baptisms, or just the whole thing's all a mess. And he says, I go to the um, Orthodox church because some of my relatives are Orthodox. I go, okay. So can I ask you something, James? What do you feel is the difference when you are in an Orthodox service compared to a Catholic service. And he said, huh, in the Orthodox Church, I feel God. In the Catholic Church, I don't feel anything. That's what he said. So we can't mix. When people come to me, I have a point. I do not talk about religion. They're very impressed. Because they think because I'm a priest, I'm going to start talking religion. I don't talk to them religion at all. I had a relative who used to come and do work, and he said, oh, can we have a religious debate? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Because why? When I go to the Greek, another Greek church, uh, the priest, all, oh, we talk and we have debates. I said, no, no, I don't debate. No, I'm not going to debate. But when, but when the time came and it was a bit, you know, years later, I found a little opportunity and started saying some things to him. People are impressed when you don't Bible bash. 
and do fanatical things like that. So I could be there with these people. But some people have been coming now for years. Like my Tyler. He's a Catholic but doesn't believe much. He hates the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church in Spain, they betrayed his father during confession. His father confessed and the priest went and told the government and the government put him in jail. He hates the Catholic Church. And um, I never talked to him about religion. Never. If he asks, and he's got a good disposition, I'll talk to him. If not, I'm not going to talk to him. And he's been coming now to our monastery and doing the tolls for 25 years. He doesn't have a good disposition to listen to anything, so why should I do anything? And I think he respects me because of that. He's very respectful, he calls me father, this, he's very, very nice. But he doesn't believe. That's okay. The Muslim didn't believe in it ever, but he even said that the Orthodox is good. So this poor monk at the time, Elder Theodore, got confused. And he asked God to show him who's got the truth. And that's not praying with this man. He didn't pray with the Syrian. He didn't talk to the Syrian. He was just impressed with the Syrian's ascetical life. And he got knocked out, topsy-turvy, got knocked out completely, and he started to have a bit of doubt, what's going on? Like a lot of you get mixed up. I've had thoughts too, I go, what's going on? Like, oh, very, they look very good, and but what's going on? Well, on the third day, a voice with no visible source came to me saying, go, Theodore, and you will see the Syrian monk's faith, you will see it. So the next day I went and sat near him, waiting to see something to explain the meaning of what, what the voice had said. I sat there for an hour watching him as he stood, reciting verses in Syriac. So that would have made it so it goes, I'm, I'm not seeing anything contrary, I'm seeing this man still praying. This man's still praying, he's standing and still praying. As God is my witness, I saw a dove hovering over his head, as black as soot, as if it had flown down the chimney, dirty and run down. I realised that his faith was just like this sooty and disgusting looking bird and I could see, that I could see. This holy soul truly told us all with this many tears and sighs. In other words, all because someone holds external characteristics of being holy, it doesn't mean they're holy. What did Christ say? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name, etc.? It says, go away. I don't know you. I don't know you, Christ says. You're not going to be saved. But, but, but we did all these things. You're not going to be saved. Why? Why? Because you have to have, in, in that case with Christ, belief that Christ was the Messiah, that Christ was the Son of God, that Christ was God, and only through him can you be saved. Today, and by the way, John Moscus is considered a holy father. In other words, the whole Orthodox Church is bound to believe in him, to believe his writings. He's a holy father. That's what the definition of holy father means. Not everyone's holy father. A martyr might not be a holy father. Or an ascetic on Mount Athos, he lived a holy life, he died. And even if his relics are incorrupt, even if his neighbors give off myrrh, What's the definition of a holy father? People think, oh, one who confesses the faith. No, because St. John of the Latter is considered a holy father and he didn't write anything about heresy. He only wrote about ascetical life, but he's considered a holy father, such that on the fourth Sunday of Lent, we commemorate him. The whole Orthodox Church, every Orthodox Church in the world commemorates St. John of the Latter. He's considered a holy father because he has given to the church teachings for the benefit of souls. Universal, everyone believes nothing that he wrote was wrong. It's been accepted by the church. 
So St. John Moscos, St. John Damascene, St. John Chrysostom, you don't have to be a hierarch, you don't have to be a clergyman, you can be even, you can be even uh, just a monk. And you don't have to be speaking about just dogma. You can be just talking about spiritual, like Saint Isaac the Syrian. We have a whole book of his, a very thick book, uh, a Seroku homilies. He did not speak about heresy, but he's considered a holy father by the whole Orthodox Church. That's what a holy father is. So Saint John uh, Moscus is a holy father. Now, Saint Paisios, is he a holy father? Well, the way it's going, his teachings are now being read universally by nearly everyone in the Orthodox, like they've been translated into so many languages there, and his teachings are beneficial. So he could be termed as a holy father. On the level of the great fathers. Some fathers, yes, they wrote theological works, but not all of them. They don't get mixed up with that. They don't have to be bishops, they don't have to be clergy, and they don't have to have, uh, be confessing the true faith. They can just be talking about even spiritual life. Something which is going to help the Orthodox Church as a whole. And St. Paisa's works are being read by any all different people in the whole Orthodox world. So the truth was that this Syrian monk was a heretic who followed a heretic who was condemned by the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And even though he looked externally very spiritual, very holy, his soul was black as soot. Because heresy blackens us. But we're not told that anymore. Priests today are signing papers from the Catholic schools or the Protestant schools. The people go to the schools and say, I want to enroll my child in the school. They go, okay, take this form, take it to your priest. What, what religion are you? Orthodox? Oh, that's okay. Just take it to the priest and get him to sign it, that you are part of the church, that, you, you know, that you're an Orthodox Christian, whatever, and bring it back to us and we'll accept you. And the Orthodox priest today, oh their hands becoming paralyzed with how many signatures they're doing. Signing, 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 signing. We have one, I won't say where, an abbot. An abbot. And people say, oh, this is the saliva again. Oh, oh he's fantastic. He's, he's so holy. He looks like an Athenite monk. He's really, really good. Yes, and? Ah, oh, in confession, he told us to take our child out of the Orthodox school and put it into a Catholic school because they're better. Another abbot, I won't say where, said to people to send their kids to Coptic schools because they're really good. They're very pious, go to Coptic schools. And then you wonder why God is permitted this tyranny that we're going through today is because of, mostly because of heresy. Not immorality as much, that's bad too. Heresy. So who was Severus? This her the heresy which this deceived monk followed was that of, the, was that of Severus of Antioch. I think, I think he was a patriarch. He is the founder of the Syriac Jacobite Orthodox Church. Severus and the heresies he held have been condemned by the fourth and later on recondemned by the fifth, sixth, and seventh. Four ecumenical councils condemn the heresy of the monophysites. And yet we have these beasts today, these beasts that are saying to us, orthodox beasts, that are saying to us that the fourth ecumenical council was a mistake. Now, some of you might say, that's terrible how you speak. You call an orthodox bishop a beast. No, I'm not, no, no, no. The saints call them beasts. I'm just repeating their words. And that's a very soft word, beasts. Remember when we read last time of that monk, of that bishop that was, um, uh, that had a really nice bishop and the people didn't listen? And then they, then they had this really, uh, this bishop that was horrible, treated them horribly, taking their money, using, uh, it was a really terrible bishop. And even they got shocked at the end. These people that were leading sinful lives say, oh God, why, why did you give us this monster? 
This monster, Gregory. They use the word monster. Not Herman monster, a real monster. Then God spoke to the people and said, well, he didn't say one thing. How dare you call your bishop a monster? Did he say that? No. Did a saint appear and condemn them and say, why did you call him a monster? Your monsters. No. God said, I couldn't find a person worse for you. I couldn't find a bishop that's worse than him. So I had to give you that one. In other words, God agreed that he was a monster. And today we have many monsters. You don't have to watch sci-fi movies anymore to look at monsters. And some of you like that type of stuff. We have them in the church. They're right in front of us. So that's another thing. Remember what I said before, what that saint said, St. John Chrysostom, do you prefer to offend God than rather to, to offend another human? So in other words, in my case, I should say, I'm not going to call the monsters for, for polite reasons because I don't want to offend them. Now, you need to know that in the Orthodox Church today, there are beautiful, holy bishops and clergymen. And you need to know that there are also monsters. We're going to find out towards the end, if I even get there, what do we do when we are encountered with a monster? Do we leave the church? Do we stay at home? One man rang me up after the talk, and um, he didn't, he didn't, I, don't know, I don't know if he heard my talk, but he wanted to ring up. Sometimes because you're on the YouTube and they, they say, oh, this person's popular. Let's ring him up so I can say I, I know him. But after the end of the conversation, they don't tell anyone that, 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 that they know me because I rip them apart. Well, I ripped him apart. He says, oh, I'm not going to go to the churches because they're all heretics and I'm going to stay home with my kids and we're, gonna, we're praying at home on our own. I go, so you're saying that every Orthodox church in Australia that everyone's bad, every priest is bad, everyone's bad, and you're going to stay at home. He goes, yes. I said, sorry, I haven't got time for your crap. I, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not going to argue. And I said, number one, you're talking over me. Number two, you don't have, you don't have an ounce of humility at all. I'm speaking to you. I'm trying to explain things to you. And you go, do, 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 like that. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, 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 yes, Father, yeah, but, 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 uh, you know, so you're going to stay home with your kids. You're going to take your kids away from the church. Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. And I said, okay. Cluck. <laughs> Finished. What, are you gonna, what am I going to do with him? I tried. You can't say I didn't try. I tried. I spoke to him for about half an hour. Then I started getting headaches and I couldn't take it. The Fourth Ecumenical Council was held in Chalcedon. This is a city... I think opposite where Hagia Sophia was, St. Sophia in Constantinople, which is on the European side, and Chalcedon was opposite on the Asian side there where St. Ephemia was martyred. The council taught that Jesus Christ has two had two natures, divine and human. Those who rejected this teaching became known as monophysites from the Greek word Single nature. Mono meaning one. Physites, physi meaning nature. Monophysites. The council decided in favour of the dogma of two natures of Christ and it condemned those who rejected its authority, the authority of the council, and persisted in their errors, expelling them from the body of Christ. They were anathematised. However, if they repented, they were, they were accepted back in straight away. Some of them did repent. Some of them pretended to repent. That's another thing. You have, to, you have to know about that. Some of them pretended to repent, but they were still heretics within themselves. They didn't want to lose their positions. Some of them had stubbornness. They said, no, we don't accept it. So 
What happened at this fourth ecumenical council? Like what happened at the first ecumenical council, which is the icon that you have of Saint Spiridon. He's holding a tile. So Saint Spiridon was uneducated. He never had the theological mind of Athanasius the Great and a lot of others, great fathers. At the, at the, he was very simple. He was a shepherd. But they made him a bishop because he was pious. He was a miracle worker. He was a very pious person, holy. He was married and he had one child. And I uh, became a bishop later on. And he couldn't take listening to this heretic, Arius, that was saying the Christ is in God. He couldn't take it. So he stood up and he said, I want to speak. And the father said, no, 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 no. Sit down. Why? Because he can't, you know, he didn't have the knowledge. I go, how are you going to talk against Arius, this, this satanic knowledge that he had? And St. Spiritus says, no. So St. Constantine, the great, he said he has a right to speak because he's part of the council. So St. Spiritus stood up, as you see in the icon that you've got, and you've got a part of his slipper to venerate, uh, all blessings today. And he stood and he said, he, stood, he held a tile in his hand, he said, in the name of the Father, and fire shoot up, and of the Son, and water came out, and of the Holy Spirit, and at the end was the sand left. There was a lot of miracles at the First Biblical Council. So now Achilles said to Arius or to his followers, if you've got the truth, make oil come out of that rock. They couldn't do it. And so Narhelios prayed and oil came out of the rock. There was a miracle of St. Nicholas that he couldn't take the blasphemies of Arius, so he slapped him across the face. That was an offence to do that in front of the emperor and him being a bishop. He was immediately jailed and he was taken off all his um, bishop's clothing, the, the clothing that makes him a bishop, and he was in jail. And then, I can't remember, probably the mother of God, Christ, appeared. They gave him back his, all his clothing and gave him the gospel. And they appeared to Saint Constantine and said that he acted out of zeal. What he did was not evil. What he did was inspiration from God, from his zeal for God's truth. And he, they, they led him back into the council and gave him back his position as a bishop. There was another miracle, a fourth one, I can't remember it. So there's always miracles in all the councils to confirm, not only theologically, but also with miracles. So I had a, a, a fellow who was helping me, a clergyman. He was helping me with editing years ago, like the blurbs at the back of the, the blurbs at the back of the talks. I used to write them. Then I used to get them checked for grammar because my grammar's not that good. And so I used to get him to check it anyway. So I, once I did something and I wrote in there that what confirmed the Seventh Ecumenical Council, apart from the teachings that the fathers gave, were the miracles with the icons. There was these miracles that occurred during the iconoclast period, miracles with icons, which confirmed that icons are to be venerated. So this man said to me, no, 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 you stick to theological. No, no, no miracles. So he made me take it out. I didn't like that, but I didn't publish that. Something was yucky. And then when I was reading the Seventh Ecumenical Council, a more detailed account, lo and behold, it said in there that the, that the fathers during the Ecumenical, Seventh Ecumenical Council brought to, brought to the attention of the fathers there the miracles that had occurred during the iconoclast persecutions. One of them was some pagans, I don't know what, what they were, they were using a little church as a house and those icons on the walls. And what they did is they, an arrow or something, they shot at the, was it the mother of God, I'm not sure, or Christ, and it started bleeding. The icons started bleeding and people came and got the, um, got the blood and they were healing people. And they brought that in that into there. So together with their theological discussions and the miracles, they confirmed that icons are to be venerated and anathema to whoever doesn't venerate them, including to those in 2020 or 2021 
the anathema applies to them too, who did not venerate the icons with their lips, but instead bow down to them or use masks. Anathema, it says. And it says, it, uh, I read it to you last time. Whoever does not venerate with their lips the holy icons, anathema. Anathema means you cut off from the church. But that's what our bishop told us. That's what our priest told us. Well, anathema to them as well. It's as simple as that. And I'm not anathematizing them. I don't have that authority. The church anathematizes them. So at the miracle, in, in the Fourth Ecumenical Council, St. Ephemia, because her relics were present there, by the way, St. Ephemia's relics give off blood. And that blood does not go off, doesn't dry up, and it smells like myrrh. And they used to collect the blood from a little hole in her casket coming out. And they used to collect them in bottles. So she's a big miracle worker. And they had her relics there. And um, during this council, the Orthodox and the Monophysites were arguing who had the truth. So they had the idea, okay, the Monophysites recognized an Ephemia because she was from a um, you know, century before whatever it was. Let's do the following. Let's get the tome. The tome is the confession of faith written out. The Orthodox said that Christ has two natures and the Monophysite said he has only one nature. They got the two tomes, opened up her relics, where she's incorrupt, and they put in her arm, on one arm they put the Orthodox and the other arm they put the Monophysite one. They closed the tomb with two keys or whatever they had, stood guard so no one could be there. Stood guard was Monophysites and Orthodox, so they couldn't open it up secretly. After three days of prayer, they opened up the, the coffin, and what did they find? They found St. Ephemia was holding the confession of faith, the tome of the Orthodox in her arms, and the Monophysite one, the heterodox one, was under her feet. She was treading on it. Did they change? No. Why? Back to your stem. Pride. What did Arius' mummy say to him? Arius, my son, who's correct? Athanasius, who says that Christ is God as well, as well as man? Or you, that says that Christ is only man? A perfect man, maybe, or whatever. A sinless man, but just a man. And he said, mummy, just like Charles says about his mother, mummy, mummy, um... Athanasius is right, but I can't now admit it. I can't go. I can't go back. I've gone too far. That's what happens to us when we've got egotism. A lot of you, when you argue with your husband or your wife or whatever, you know you know you're wrong. A lot of times you're wrong, but the ego won't allow us to admit it. Admit it. We just make up. No, no, no. I'm right. I'm right. That's ego. I used to hear preachers in Greek when I was younger, when I came to church, and I used to, Greek ones, they used to say that from a voice more, egotism, someone can lose their soul. I just couldn't comprehend what they were talking about. I know now, I've seen many souls being lost because of egotism. Egotism is the worst. You believe that the Catholics don't know that the Orthodox Church is the truth. They know. I'll give you an example to show you the stubbornness of heretics. Some might object to the word heretics. You don't call your neighbor as a Catholic or, or a Protestant or a heretic. Even though officially they are. But differently, you can't just say heterodox, they're heterodox. They're of another confession of faith. They, they have a different faith. And who do we call heretics? Those who are trying to convert us. 
Now, I will tell you who are the worst heretics. Some of you might say, are oh, the Catholics, are oh, the Monophysites, are oh, this, or oh, that. The historians. Orthodox patriarchs and bishops who are trying to tell people that ecumenism is good and that all of them have some truth in them and things like that. They are heretics because they're trying to convert us. If your neighbor next door is a Catholic and they're trying to convert you, they're heretics. If they leave you alone, they're heterodox, out of politeness, heterodox. Don't get mixed up and just call your friend at work, uh, what religion are you? I'm um, Presbyterian. Heretic, heretic. No, you don't do that. Don't say, just, just say, oh, okay, leave them alone. When I go, there's sometimes I've been to the supermarket, someone goes, uh, what, are you, what are you, Father? I go, Orthodox. Oh, we're all the same. You know, they speak, some of them, some of them are like a European background or something like that. We're all the same. What do I say? Do I say, heretic? No, I say nothing. But you're not confessing the truth. Did she ask me? Did she ask me whether that's true? She never asked me. She just said, we're all the same. That's what she believes. She had no disposition. Christ, when he was being examined by Pilate and by um, Herod, I think it was, was it Herod? Forgot now. He never answered. I can't remember now. I think it was Herod. He never answered him, not one word. Pilate, he did answer because Pilate asked him, what is truth? He asked him, at least he asked him a question. But the other, uh, Goanna, he didn't ask anything. He didn't ask not one question, so Christ did not speak to him at all. He remained silent, completely silent. So why should I be higher than God? They have to have some disposition. I'm going to sit there and she goes, ah, oh, as she's doing the cash register, we're all the same, Father. Yeah, and we're going to say, well, uh, in point of fact, no, it's not true. I'm going to speak Harvard type. Uh, the Orthodox Church is the one church and this and that and this and she's going... Sorry? What? 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 Oh, oh, Father, you maybe make a mistake on the cash register. And you'll get in trouble. They get upset. Don't get confused with these things. So, in Jerusalem, we have the holy fire. The first, quite a long time, for 10 minutes, something doesn't burn. There are people that have been there. And I know people that I've known. I wasn't there for that. Too many people for me. I don't like too many people. Um, but people have gone, I know people that have been there, and it's on, it's on the internet. Everyone's holding 33 candles because Christ died at 33 years old as a human, not as God. God doesn't die. And people see lightning, like flashes in the um, church, and some people's candles light up by themselves. The patriarch, Greek Orthodox patriarch, comes out and passes the flame to others, and then it passes through the church. And you see on the video, which we have on our section number, whew, what is it? Section three. Section three. We have all those videos on the Holy Light. And it shows the people putting their fire on the 33 candles. Now, if I went up there and put my finger on that one there, I'm going to get burnt. I'm going to get burnt. These are 33 candles. It's fire. And they put on their children's faces, on their beards, everything. Like on their arms there. Nothing happens. But scientists have studied that. It's all on the internet. I haven't got time now. It's all on, my, it's all on section three. Uh, the tradition is that it has to be a bishop of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek, for some reason, I don't understand, there must be some type of rule there. Uh, the Greeks have to allow the Armenian Orthodox, in inverted commas, to witness, which is a good idea, I think. So they, they don't pray together. So the Armenian goes in fully vested. They close the doors. The Israeli police first check everything. They check the tomb for fire, for anything, for matches, anything. The patriarch undresses and only has um, maybe just this on. The Armenians fully vested. What's good about that? The Armenians hate us.
if the Orthodox was doing something wrong, they would say it. So it's good that they come in. But there's no praying together. So uh, there are two holes on the tomb of, the, of Christ. One hole is, I think the Armenians get it, where he gives it to them, the Armenian from the inside, the patriarch, he's their patriarch. And the other side is the Coptic bishop. In that, in this holy sepulchre, the whole, the whole church, there are Catholics present. There are Catholics have got one area, Copts have got another area, Armenians have got another area, and the Orthodox have got the other area. I think this was taken away from the Orthodox during Turkish times to make the others happy. They gave them some sections there. Uh, yeah, so that doesn't burn. So the Armenian patriarch and his clergy see that. Do they convert? No. Do the Copts convert? No. To the Catholics, they don't participate. They're too busy hiding in their little shack over there. But they know what's happening. Now, they're very jealous people. And they just stay over there, probably looking through the keyhole to have a look at what's going on. And it has to be lit by an Orthodox and it has to be Greek. These are not miracles where, like in Fatima and all these other miracles in the Catholic Church of the sun jumping up and down and, you know, all these things and happening. These are all, as St. Ignace Benjaminov says, they are all visual. They're all like in the mind. It's demons in the air. This is not. This is a tangible miracle, just like holy water is a tangible miracle that can be examined by scientists. And that holy light has been examined by scientists and they said that that type of plasma, what they call plasma, whatever they call it, it says cannot be found. It has to be in a very moist environment while, all for, while Jerusalem is dry because it's a desert. They can't understand it and, and it's very miraculous to, even to the scientists themselves. But the thing is, what I'm trying to say to you is that don't change. So don't get confused and think that, that that's why Elder Yakovos, going back to him, he was more interested in the Catholic because he had questions, he didn't know much, but the, but the pastor didn't talk to him. Showed him around, was nice, this and that, gave him food, but that was it. But yet our Orthodox hierarchs, and that, they, they go with them, pray with them, and not just Christians, you with inverted commas, Christians, like the monophysites, they believe in Christ, but in a broken way. So we call them Christians just as a politeness, but there cannot be no, as our saints say, outside the church, there can be no Christianity. True Christianity is only within the Orthodox church. Outside the church, there is no Christianity. But we call them Christians for politeness and they do believe in whatever they believe in broken ways. But not, they're not, they, that's why they need to be told that they haven't got the truth. And these people go there, they pray with them. They recognise them as bishops and priests. They exchange gifts together. They do kisses of like they're united. Because when we do let us love one another, the one one may confess with the, with the Catholics, they kiss each other to show unity of faith. We don't do that anymore, but we do it inside the altar. The priests do it. They kiss each other to show that they've got a unity of faith. Because straight after, let us love one another, one may confess, I think we start, I think we do the creed. You need to have unity of faith to say the creed. And they get all that sticky stuff all over them, the her heresy. And they become lost. So we don't hate the heterodox. We can hate what they believe, but not them. As for the heretics, the ones that are trying to convert us, including orthodox ones, well, I think we need to be negative against them to protect yourself. The various... The various churches that descended from those who rejected the Fourth Council have been known by a variety of names, including Monophysites, non-Chalcedonians, 
because non meaning they don't accept the council at Chalcedon. Anti-Chalcedonians, they're against the council of Chalcedon. Pre-Chalcedonians, the lesser or spare separated Eastern churches. And in recent times, they've been called Oriental Orthodox. Today, the Oriental Orthodox are com uh, composed of uh, six autocephalous churches. That means they're self-ruled. They're independent, but they're same, like ours. Russian, Kosdanople, Serbian, Bulgarian. They're all separate churches, but they are of the same church. But each run rules itself. No other one has power over the other. They are self-ruled. That's what we call them. Or I think it's autocephalous or autocephalous. I'm not sure how to say it, so to be truthful. Um, they self-rule, basically. They have no one over, them, over themselves. These six groups, which is similar to us in that they are independent, but they all belong to the same, which is the Oriental Orthodox Church, while all of ours, all the, all the ones we've got, Bulgarian, Romanian, Serbian, Constantinople, uh, Russia, etc., Romania, they all are independent, but belong to the same church, which is called the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's when people write me, write to us with names, I've got to write back to them and say, firstly, are these the baptismal names? Because they want me to commemorate, they, you know, they send money, want commemoration. So, okay. Number one, are they their baptismal names? I will only accept that. No double names. That's not Orthodox. Number one, if they've been baptized with double name, sorry, we can't do it. Let them go fix it up with the priest that done it. Number number two, are they Oriental Orthodox? Sometimes even when I'm suspicious, I go, what church was that person baptized at? And they say, oh, such and such in Texas and this. I look it up. Okay, Eastern Orthodox Church. I can commemorate. We can commemorate, but not if they're from the Oriental Orthodox Church. So let's go here. And when I say Orthodox, only out of politeness. Orthodox means true belief. They do not have true belief. But that's their name, so we just say it out of, just out of ease. So they, these, are the, these are the six six bodies. The Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, Egypt. The Syriac, the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, also known as the Jacobite Church, which is the leader was Severus. The Armenian Apostolic Church, the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tiwakedu Church, and the Eritrean Orthodox Tiwadil Church. Anyway, I can't even say those names. There's six groups of them. They comprise of a total of 60 million members worldwide. I think I made a mistake before for 80. 60 million. They consider themselves as part of one church, not our church. They consider themselves part of the Oriental Orthodox churches and are not in communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church. doesn't matter what these ecumenists and heretics tell you. They are not in communion. That's the big, big thing now. That's what they're learning at the theological colleges, even here. That it's all a mistake. The Fourth Ecumenical Council was a mistake. These people are orthodox. They are orthodox. They keep on saying it. And once again, we don't hate them. I would love, I would love to see all of them to come into the orthodox church and be joined. What a, that, that would be amazing. And the Catholics too but only under the condition that they accept the Holy Orthodox Church in its fullness, which has never been changed. We have changed nothing. Some of these heretics, like patriarchs, they say heretical things, but they have not changed the faith officially. No one is told that you will say the creed from now on like this. No one is told that you will recognize Christ with only one nature. We don't hear any of that. They say it, and they might even preach it, but it's not official. The Oriental Orthodox churches of today continue to stubbornly reject the dogmatic definition of the Fourth Ecumenical Council. That is, they oppose the Orthodox teaching of the two natures in Jesus Christ, the divine and the human natures. We say Christ is one person, but he has two natures, but he's one person. 
there can be no unity with the Oriental Orthodox churches until they renounce the heresy of monotheism and accept the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh ecumenical councils. These churches only accept the first three ecumenical councils, while the Nestorians only accept the first two. The seventh ecumenical council confessed as follows, quote, with the fathers of this synod, we confess that he who was incarnate of the Immaculate Mother of God and ever Virgin Mary has two natures, recognizing him as perfect God and perfect man, as also the council of Charles, Charles had declared, has declared, expelling from the divine atrium of the church as blasphemers, Eftichios and the Oscaros, and placing in the same category Severus. That's the Holy Fathers. That's an exact quote from the Holy Fathers, what, what they said. That they confessed that Christ has two natures, even in the seventh, even though the Ecumenical Council, that was 300 years after the, the fourth, around about. The fourth was 431. This was in 787, so about 300 years. And they said, uh, anyone that doesn't believe in the two natures of Christ are blasphemers, and they are to be basically expelled from the church like Eftichios, the Oscaros, and Severus. However, now we leave the fathers, that's the end of the quote. However, the ecumenists who are supporters of union with the anti-Chalcedonians claim that the disagreement at the Fourth Ecumenical Council between the Orthodox and the Monophysites uh, was essentially a tragic misunderstanding. The Holy Fathers, they say, their present fail to consider that people of the other religion, the monophysite religion, had different backgrounds. And so therefore they used different language. It was all a mistake. The two groups are from, there was a, a monophysites from Syria and monophysites from Egypt. They were the main two groups. They caused a lot of trouble in the, Byz in the Byzantine Empire. They weakened the empire because they weren't united with the empire because they didn't recognize the fourth ecumenical council. Many emperors and many bishops tried to compromise and make up formulas that will make them happy, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Nothing they did could actually bring them back to the Orthodox church. Justinian, which is one of the greatest emperors of the Orthodox Church, he was later on, people went against him and slandered him, that he was a pro monophysite because he did everything he could to bring them back to the faith. But they stubbornly did not agree. Now, they're tricking you today. They're saying, well, the heresy, that it's not really a heresy, what it is, it's it's just they're using St. Kirill's words, but they're saying the same thing. They're not saying the same thing. They are heretics. Now, you might say, I'm not interested in what you've got to say. I'm interested in what the Father's got to say. Very good. I like that. More energy today. So I'm going to quote now from St. Paisios, Manathos. It's in the book by Hayim Isaac, that big thick green book, pages 658 to 661. Okay, so I, I said a lot of bad things today, one can say, but let's see what he says. This is a quote straight from the book. He, meaning St. Paisus, considered the anti-Chalcedonians, that is the Monophysites, along with the other heretics and those of other religions, to be creatures of God and our brothers according to the flesh. Creatures, not, that's not a bad, creatures mean creation. Creatures means created by God. So they are created by God. And they are, they are our brothers according to the flesh. Like we have a body, they've got a body. We are brothers in that way. In terms of our common descent from Adam, we all came from Adam. But, St. Paisus did not consider them children of God and our brothers according to the Spirit. Characterizations he believed applied only to Orthodox Christians. St. Paisus said, 
The only brothers that we have in the spirit are fellow Orthodox Christians, not those of other faiths. And by the way, they use the word heretic there. Does that clear things up? Because some of you are very confused about this. I was confused for many years too. They are creatures of God. They are created by God. They are our brothers from Adam in the way of the flesh, in our bodies. But that's where it stops. But they are not children of God in the sense. And our brothers according to the spirit. Now, just in case some of you, thought up in one second, just in case some of you get confused with that, thank you for that. Christ, if you read the Bible, and you should, you read the, um, the Gospels, he sometimes referred to people as daughter, and sometimes he referred to people as um, child. If they were of the Jewish religion, you use the word child of God, daughter, son, etc. But if they were of another religion or pagans, he did not use those words. Because at that time, the true religion was the Jewish religion. He differentiated between those who were of the, of the correct faith, which was the Jewish religion, compared to the others that were of other religions. So there are a lot of examples, daughter or, or child, you are healed or something like that. But the others, he never referred to them like that. Saint Paisius is saying the same thing. Regarding those who sympathize with the monophysites, meaning the Orthodox, and their fervent supporters among the Orthodox, he observed, quote, they don't say that the monophysites didn't understand the Holy Fathers. They say that the Holy Fathers didn't understand the monophysites. In other words, they talk as if they're right, that the monophysites are correct, and that the Fathers misunderstood them. So I'm going to read that again. It's very important. So these ecumenists, they say that the Holy Fathers got it wrong. Not that the monophysites got it wrong. The Holy Fathers got it wrong. The Holy Fathers misunderstood them. Not that the heretics misunderstood the Holy Fathers. This is what these monsters are saying today. And they are monsters. Now, your question. Well, that troubled me a lot. I have to admit, when I came to the church, that troubled me a lot. That question was also posed to St. Siloanos of Manathos and many fathers. They say, only the Orthodox will be saved. As for the rest, it's up to God. We don't know what happens to them. We don't know how they're going to be judged. It depends on how much they know the truth. Are they rejecting the truth? For example, we have some pygmies, for example, over in South America, whatever they are, and all these people, different people. They have never even heard who Christ is. So we can't say they're going to be saved. We can't say they're going to be condemned. We don't know. And the Holy Fathers say Christ, who is full of love, cares more for their souls than what we do. And he is doing what he can to save them, but we can't say they're saved. But at the same time, we can't say they're not saved. We leave it to God. And that's if you read the Holy Fathers, even St. John of Kronstadt, a great saint in Russia, he never, ever said to the heterodox that came to him that you're not going to be saved. But he did tell him that the Orthodox is the truth, but he never made those type of statements. I think even St. Paisius didn't say it. St. Yakovus didn't say it. St. Porfirius didn't say it. And many other people didn't say it. We have to be understanding of the Spirit of God. Just like when the apostles said to Christ because they rejected his preaching, they go, should we pray like Elias did to bring down fire and burn them? And Christ says, you don't even know what spirit you're talking about. You don't even know what you're talking about. And there's meaning to all that. 
Remember this says, whoever doesn't believe and be baptized will be condemned. Doesn't believe. In other words, they were given the opportunity to believe and they rejected it. We don't know exactly who, what, how, what's in person's conscience. You leave it to God and we pray for them. And that's as far as we can go. The fathers of the church have not given us anything further than that. There has to be a rejection as well. Like those monophysites and those people over there, they see the holy light. That's it. That only happens for the orthodox. It's simple. Why can't they see that and then say, well, this is the truth? But they don't. They're, they're, they're in trouble. But as for some pious in their own way, who don't even know, some of them don't even know the difference between Eastern Orthodox and, and um, Oriental Orthodox. They don't know. How they're going to be judged? That's not for me to know. We go on with the book. He considered proposals to erase from the liturgical books statements identifying the Oscar or Severus as heretics to be blasphemy against the Holy Father. So these monsters... These ecumenists, because they don't want to offend the, the Orientals, they're saying we're going to have to revise our liturgical books. So, for example, when we commemorate the miracle of St. Ephemia, the Holy Fathers in their troparia use horrible words to describe the heretics, like the Oscaros, calling them demonic and things like that. He said, that's not nice. We have to remove them. We have to remove them not to offend the, the heretics, like services that are dedicated to those who died under the Roman Catholics. They call them satanic and the Pope and all. Beautiful descriptions. And St. Paisio says, anyone who wants to, to change the liturgical books to please the heretics is blasphemy, it's a blasphemy against the Holy Fathers. He said, quote, so many div divinely enlightened Holy Fathers who were there at that time didn't, meaning the Fourth Ecumenical Council, so many divinely enlightened Holy Fathers who were, at, who were there at that time didn't understand them, didn't understand the monophysites, in other words, took them the wrong way, they made mistakes. And now we come along after so many centuries, 1,600 years, in other words, to correct the Holy Fathers. That's what these monsters are doing. They're correcting the Holy Fathers and St. Ephemia. And they don't take the miracle. Oh, there it is. And St. Paisio says, and they don't take the miracle of St. Ephemia into account. And then he says sarcastically, didn't she understand the heretic's term too? In other words, and uh, are we going to say that St. Ephemia misunderstood the, what the heretics were saying in their confession of faith that Christ only has one nature? Did she make a mistake? So he's being a bit sarcastic. And you say, oh, no, 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 saints, they're not sarcastic. No, 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 no. Because, no, no, no. you know, some people say, oh, you've been sarcastic. Well, sorry, the saints were even sarcastic when certain times, certain things to get a point across through how you say it. Are you saying it with hate? Or are you saying it with an anger because people are losing their souls because they're told that the monophysites are the same as us? I have m many of them that listen to my talks and they write to me. Oh, Father, they're so good, the talks, they're, they're really, really, really good in this and that, whatever. Uh, but, you know, I don't like the way that you say this, this and that, whatever. You know, I'm not going to be sucked in by their praise. It's not, okay, they like the talks, but I'm not here to be called popular on the internet. Sorry, that's not my that's not my job. I'm not here for popularity, to see how many views we get. By the way, the last talks head into fourteen thousand, which is in three weeks. That's very interesting. Not even other talks got that many views. In three weeks, 14,000 people have watched that last talk, which shows you that people are really, really confused about COVIDism, etc. So I'm happy. Why am I happy? 
Because I got a lot of views. No. Because I got a lot of subscribers. Not that many. What is it? Thirteen thousand something. Um, no. I'm happy because people are learning. That's what I'm happy about. If I was here because I want to become popular, I would advise you to run. Some out the windows. You can do what the SWAT people do. You can even go through the glass. <laughs> out. Run. If you see that I'm doing this for my popularity, I think that, no. And it's not popularity because the majority of priests don't like me, And number one. And number two, there's a chance that I'm going to go through trouble with the upper-ups. So that's not something that you're there for popularity. I feel sorry for those people, I do, and those people that wrote to me, like those, the, the um, monophysites and all of them, I feel for them. They're really, really nice people and they want, and you know, they're, they're, they're leading their lives, but they have to know, and I'm not saying this out of, to hurt them, they're not in the correct faith. The Orthodox Church is the truth, that is it. I can't pretend just so I can get a couple of praises. Like, am I that desperate? I'm, you know, if I need to praise, I'll pay someone to praise me. Just praise someone. At least I don't have to lose my soul. Or I get some bloggers, they, they, they're into that. You're beautiful, you're nice, you're this, you're that. It's just too much. As time goes on, as the talks become more popular, you'll see all the riffraff come out. Oh, I'm going to go through a lot from them because I was laying low for a while. But as soon as you start getting out a bit too much and all that, well, I think it's from God's permission as well for our humility not to get proud, as we'll hear soon if we get to that. And St. Spiridon actually says in the dismissal we heard today, they were shown forth as a champion of the first council and a wonder worker, O Spiridon, our God-bearing Father. Being divinely illumined with the divine spirit's light and dogmatizing simply on the Trinity with faith, the all-wise hierarch Spiridon smothered and destroyed the dark babblings of Arius and he was glorified by wise and learned men and confirmed the council mightily. His miracle and the other three, as well as the Holy Fathers and the teachings, confirmed that the first ecumenical council was correct, was from God, and that Christ was also God and not just man, like Arius, another monster, believed. I don't usually ask for questions, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to finish today, so I'm going to, hopefully, we'll do another one soon. Maybe the... Um, January, when we have the, was that the, the long weekend there as well? Maybe, hopefully, God willing. So, does anyone have any questions? And I don't like if you are like agitated, it's going to be humble. If you're agitated, it's not a good spirit. Yep. Well, that's uncanonical because it says that even though they're children, they're still, they're still not orthodox. So that means that they're forcing orthodox children to pray together with those of another faith, which is forbidden by the holy canons of the church. Georgina. Father, um, what about if we, are in, we attend a funeral of a heterodox person? And they say, like, at the Our Father prayer, is that forbidden? Can we not attend? And well, this is a lot of controversy with that as well. I think that, strictly speaking, um, we shouldn't go into these churches at all. Uh, but there's others. I don't know if they're correct. I mean, I, I haven't really found enough information from holy elders on this topic. But... Um, if one goes there, but they're not praying, and I'm supposed they're like what the other fellow said at the back, they're not praying. So that's, that's not forbidden. But then why are you going? I mean, if you're not 
I don't know. So if you can go there without praying, I I just avoid it because I don't want to offend God. I don't want to accidentally pray with them, have the same spirit as them. I don't. I, I don't want that. Now it could be your mother, it could be your father. I don't know. I don't. I. I. Uh, it's a good question, and I haven't got a good authority on that from the elders, the God enlightened people. I haven't, haven't found it properly. And I'd rather wait till I do find it. Personally, I don't like it. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into any of their churches just in case I lose my soul. Now, if, for example, the uh, hierarchs that are supposedly have all this theological knowledge, they go into their churches, they become contaminated. A lot of kids went to Catholic schools, they're contaminated. When I say contaminated, I mean in heresy. Why take the chance? So, but I'm not going to give it a definite answer because I need, and anyway, if anyone's listening to the tape or anyone here knows, any fathers, holy elders that uh, have spoken on this matter, give it to me. I would like to know and present it. Personally, I will just stick to what the fathers say. Whoever goes into a heretical church to pray will be excommunicated. That means they can't commune, to pray. Now, if you stand there as an observer, maybe maybe that's not, I don't know. You know, if you can say it's your mother or your father, and you stand there as an, as an observer without praying with them, that's a, that's a different thing. But as I said, I haven't got a definite answer. Uh, one more. What a second, John. Um, out of all the uh, liturgies I've been to in the Greek Orthodox Church, at the end, towards the end of the liturgy, the priest always says, through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, yes. the Yes, correct. Um, so how is it that we ask for the prayers of the Holy Fathers, but at the same time, we say that they were too harsh on these people back then, or they were for, the language that yes. they Firstly, you're much calmer, much calmer. Even on your face, you're much calmer. You know why? Because you're listening to Orthodox fathers. Not me, Orthodox. So you're much calmer, number one. That's good. That's a positive thing. Secondly, you're asking a question which is not coming from some type of gotcha question. It's actually a very, very good question. The answer is that they say the they say through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, that they say it like they say everything else. For example, they talk about um, you know have mercy on us, God, according to their great mercy, we pray the I can have mercy again. We pray for you know whatever, whatever, all these things. But they don't, but if you talk to them personally, they don't talk about uh, salvation. They don't talk about it. I went to those churches. I know you know, and even in our own churches. They, it's like people talk to me now and say, I went to a funeral. Whether well, rational or that doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're there everywhere. And they said that the priest was saying, and uh, uh, eternal be their memory. We remember them. We remember them. We remember them and we won't forget them. And those things like that. Goes, but where? he didn't talk about the soul. He didn't talk about, he says, and this is a consolation for you because you will always remember our departed sister. Anna, and things like that. That's not the purpose of the prayers. The purpose of the prayers is to be praying for God to have mercy on her soul. They don't talk about salvation, hardly any of them. They don't talk against the fornication. They don't talk against adultery. They don't talk against the contraception pill. They don't talk about magic. They don't talk about hardly any.